excess malarkey. Uh, uh, I'm assuming you're not contagious over the television. Now, it may be that you've never been to excess malarkey before. Uh, well, it's a comedy club uh, which uh, charges as little as money as possible to put on the, put on the best comedians that we possibly can. Normally, um, the, it has to be the best comedians who happen to be passing through or uh, near enough to Manchester um, to, for it to be financially viable. But in this day, in these days of plague and ague, such considerations are are not things. So we have an embarrassing, uh, an embarrassingly good lineup. Um, I mean, we always have a good lineup, but this is a sort of superstar lineup. So um, do stick with us throughout because we've got five uh, marvelous comedians, and I am the. Uh, big corduroy glue that uh, holds it together. I'm Toby. I'm the regular MC. Uh, I'm uh, wearing. Uh, I'm yes, corduroy. Is, I'm, I'm ribbed for your extra pleasure this evening. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm the MC of uh, Excess Malarkey, which has been running for 23 years. And uh, we'll just try and uh, we'll we'll try and have an awful lot of fun. I hope you're you're doing well. I've I've been I've actually been out today uh, for the first time uh, in in a while, and I was slightly disappointed actually because. Um, I'd kind of romantically built up some sort of post-apocalyptic wasteland in my head, and I was rather disappointed to see quite a few people were driving around, and everyone seemed reasonably happy. I was expecting to people see people, you know, fighting over the last jam of the, the jar of marmalade, or to see a dead body clasping, you know, wedges of cash and that cash <laughs> blowing in the wind, and me going, "Oh, the things we used to value." Um, but there was none of that. It was it was largely affable people going. Oh, no, please have the last apple. Um, I mean, the last apple in the shop, not the last apple, which will be a poignant end of season episode of Coronavirus, the uh, Netflix series that uh, I'm sure will be on. So talking of Netflix series, I'm stuck in quite an awkward, awkward situation because I wasn't early enough with the Tiger King to be its discoverer and champion, and not late enough to be the first person to go, well, I've seen that and I don't know what all the fuss is about. So uh, sadly, I don't get uh, enough attention for either. Which uh, which is leaves me as something of a pariah in the world of uh, popular culture. Um, I'm going to be mercifully brief because uh, we've got such a good lineup. But um, we we you are you are you are as is the modern way. You probably don't need me to tell you because you understand. You can send comments in, and and I believe I'm go the heckles are going to take the form of questions which I will be receiving and responding to um, as I would at the comedy club. Um, although nobody heckles at excess malarkey, but I do talk to people until they say something because um, I, I because I'm there every week and I don't prepare. Um, <laughs> so uh, and also there are probably oh so so what I would normally do start the show uh, is chat to people and say oh where are you from that's an awful place and oh look you you're young you've probably never heard of flambards and uh, uh, and oh hello your thing um so let's let's say that we've done that um and um uh, uh what we do at, at the beginning of the show is we have there are a pair of twins twins don't come any other way who sit at the front uh and uh, we haven't seen one of them as often as we like lately richard but we wish him well but what there's a massive coincidence with the the two the two twins is that they both share a birthday and uh, it was richard and jonathan who are two of the audience mainstays of excess malarkey it was their birthday last week so happy birthday richard and jonathan who i i hope will be watching tonight um and jonathan always knows because what i have to do at the beginning of the show everybody to to, to build up an atmosphere which of course you're going to have to provide yourselves uh, is I get the audience sort of whooping and cheering and giving the acts lots of vocal and manual affirmation. And to that end, I split uh, I split the room in two, uh, uh, left and right, and uh, I get Jonathan, who sits always in the middle, uh, to name the teams. And uh, in previous weeks, I've been making up the team names in the style of Jonathan, and he's decided that he can jolly well speak for himself. <laughs> so I've been sent the team names uh, but, uh, courtesy of Jonathan and I also make the joke that Jonathan whatever team names he does uh, has Lego figures um, of those teams because he's a big collector of Lego he actually does have Lego figures of this week's team and I don't know if we can show those uh, can we can we show those I'll show them on my phone um, so this team on the left hand side so you're going to have to just choose where you think you are on the left hand side we have the uh, the dragons uh, and on the right hand side we have the wyverns, which if I remember my fighting fantasy books well enough, a wyvern is a sort of dragon. I remember, again, it was the first thing that ever killed me in Forest of Fear, a fighting fantasy book by uh, Ian Livingston. Um, 
yes. Some some of my, I was going to say jokes are very niche. Just some of them. A lot of me is just very niche. <laughs> um, and we have, can I show, we have the picture. Jonathan says, I've left, I don't have a picture of my Lego Dragon and Lego Wyvern because I left them in the office before lockdown. <laughs> See, I mean, this lockdown took us all by surprise. <laughs> Jonathan didn't even get a chance to pack all his essential Lego items to see him through the apocalypse. <laughs> oh, but I mean, this just goes to show uh, what, what times we're living in. But he's improvised, and because he's a man of uh, many, many talents, including in the Lego department, he has made his own dragon and wyvern uh, man Lego. And uh, one of them one of them has black horns, one of them has white horns. Other than that, I think they're, they're pretty much the same. So I don't know if the dragon wyvern thing is... Is, is purely divided along racial lines. I don't know. It's a can of worms I don't particularly want to get into, but um, I'm sure various dragon and wyvern historians are now shaking their fists at the screen going, God, this man knows nothing. Um, uh, well, feel free to educate us about dragons and wyverns. I, I wish I hadn't said that now because I know that there are people out there who are going to. Um, so so we have the, the dragons on the left and the wyverns on the right. So you choose when you give a round of applause. But let's let's do it. I think, you know, in this time where we're giving things a round of applause in order to show solidarity and and, and uh, support and just positive vibes, let's do it. So on the left-hand side, dragons on a count of three, make some noise. Ray! Oh, well done. Yes, very good. That was a wonderful noise. Now on the right-hand side, uh, it's the wyverns. I, I know, you've just got different coloured horns. What was that? Yes, all right. So uh, on a count of three, one, two, three, the wyverns! Way! Uh, and normally on that side is, is all the people at the door as well, so there's an unfair advantage. Um, uh, so um, so uh, what we're going to do for the purposes, and normally what we do at Excess Malarkey is we have a series of acts on, uh, one after the other, a couple of breaks, uh, and, uh, and you know, you, you're so close you can smell the acts. In fact, I haven't actually, I haven't, I'm not sure when I last showered. If this was a proper gig, I would have had a shower. Um, but I sort of feel, I, I sort of wanted to cut my hair as well. Um, but I feel that I need to sort of prove what desperate times we live in by embodying the degradation through through the medium of, of her suitedness. Uh, so um, it's odd though, isn't it? Because if I was coming out to access this Tuesday, I would have washed and I would have groomed myself. But because I'm in in a house with the woman I love, she she can just put up with me. <laughs> I, I had not having, I mean, my 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 feet are brown. Um, but uh, well, I've been gardening, and you know, um. So anyway, um, and who knows? I may only be smart uh, from the waist up. That's a mystery that will remain mine. So uh, we're going to get everybody uh, uh, together uh, to welcome onto the stage the first act. Um, who's an actor that's been playing at Excess since relatively early in our days. He was, he was, he was. I think he may have been the first actor to come from London. He was in my sights from the very beginning because he was always my favourite actor when I started out as a comedian, and he's always been a great supporter of this club. And he played on our uh, on our twentieth birthday. It was our twentieth or twenty first special special gig that we had. So he's always had a special place in our hearts. So it's very delightful that we're opening the show. Uh, uh, with one of the most uh, respected comics on the circuit, and certainly one who's played a key role in, in the success of Excess just by being associated with us since the very beginning. Uh, wyverns, dragons, stamp your feet, clap your hands, and give a big warm welcome to Mr. Robin Ince. Yay! Hello! Oh, Toby, thank you so much. Thank you. Toby, can I just say that is the finest audition piece for the Wilfred Bramble life story film that's coming out I've ever seen. Not only have you got the costume on, you've even done all the dressing behind you. Absolutely wonderful. Um, I thought I would show people first of all, because it, a few people, I don't know, maybe no one out there, but if, if anyone has ever seen one of my shows, they will go, why are they so erratic? Why do they have no focus? And I hope that this gives you some sense. This is the world that I live in. This is uh, the room that I'm in. Uh, Toby, I think you'll like this here. Uh, I have that. Uh, there's, there's the Doctor Who TARDIS, uh, though I know you would be annoyed that it's next to the Playmobil Para Island because, of course, Doctor Who fans would go, well, hang on a minute. The David Tennant universe doesn't actually have the William Hartnell Playmobil Para Island element, does it? So that's an anomaly that doesn't work. Uh, Toby, by the way, uh, introduced me to one of my favourite words of all time, which was uh, we, we were at a Doctor Who convention where Toby did some, some, some wonderful work. And uh, he said the trouble with Doctor Who fans is they are addicted to anticipointment. 
And, uh, and disappointment, if you don't know, is the delight you feel at being let down by something that you pretend to love. So a lot of the middle-aged Doctor Who fans just sit at home going, oh, brilliant, this week they're going to have a Cyberman episode. I bet they don't get the backstory correct at all. <laughs> they're wrong already. And it's an absolute delight to know. I don't want to talk about anticipation. I, uh, well, actually, I should talk because this, this crazy room, this is uh, one of the, everything about it, just if you've ever wondered, right, these are the things that I keep near me. My Kurt Vonnegut doll, uh, my uh, anatomically correct but slightly small skull, uh, my old teddy bear, uh, a figure of Jesus. Yeah, they're all there. So um, I think probably one of the most difficult periods at the moment for a lot of the people who uh, are partners of comedians is the fact that, as you can see, my, this is an attic room. My my life is, is basically a gender reversal of Jane Eyre. Uh, when I do return from tour, it's kind of like, can you can you just, just go upstairs for a while? because I need to work. And this is, I think, for a lot of people, and a lot of comics will know this, you know, you can spend a lot of time where you're never at home. You're never at home. You're always away. You're never at home. And then when you are at home, it's like, maybe you should go on tour. And this is kind of what happened a, a while ago, about four years ago. Um, I was on tour, and I had one of those moments where some of you might have actually had this moment, where you haven't gone mad, but you know it's within easy reach. So you're still just in the right position of sanity. But if you lean over, you can grab hold of the madness. So I thought I better stop doing stand up for a while. I just I, I knew it was that I was out in Brisbane, in Australia. And um, so uh, I thought, how can I make sure that I keep to that? And I thought I'll just write a little blog post, because then if I've in some way made it public, I have to keep to what I've said. Now, unfortunately, what I didn't realize was that on that particular day back in the UK, it was a very quiet news day. It was was so quiet that someone from The Guardian saw my blog post and went, could be news. I mean, it could, couldn't it, I suppose? It could be news. And so without me knowing it, I am all over the uh, bottom quarter of page 23. And um, this, unfortunately, is how my wife found out. And so at about midnight in Brisbane, I get a phone call. And it is, uh, it's, it's slightly panicked phone call. Oh, my God, I've just, I've just read the, the thing. You're going to give up sound. You can't give up stand up. I, I said, no, I just think I need a bit of a break. You know, I'm going a little bit kind of loopy, maybe. She went, no, 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 no. I think you'll go even more loopy, actually, if you give up stand-up. I went, no, 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 I, I just think a little bit, you know, just, just a little bit. She went, no, come on, come on. And eventually she said, how are we going to live? And, of course, I thought by that she meant, you know, how are we going to live financially? But I very much misjudged the how are we going to live. And uh, what I realised she was actually saying was, oh, my God, he is going to be around the house the whole time treading things into the carpet and moving the magazines, right? And this was that moment which many of you, not just comics, many of you, if you travel around, may well have had the realisation that the further you are away from the person who loves you, the greater the love is. So when you are in, for instance, if I was in Wellington, New Zealand, the magnitude of the love, it is enormous. Uh, if I was in New York, then it's, it's still a reasonable-sized love. If, uh, I mean, Aberdeen, the, the love at this point has really begun to shrink. This is like the, the, the end of the life of, 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 a, of a star now. It's really begun. And if I'm in Croydon, it's just like, oh, my God, half an hour and he's back. And I had that moment where, again, some of you may have experienced this, where you arrive home and you look in your partner's eyes and you can see this kind of expression. And you know that they love you. But at the same time, you can just see a glimmer of them going, hmm. But would I be happier as a melancholy widow? And I unfortunately have this thing where my wife doesn't normally come to my stand-up because it's not, not really her cup of tea. And uh, then I was playing the Soho Theatre in London. She said, oh, I'm going to come and see that. I went, oh. And I suddenly realised I turned this story into a bit of stand-up. And I thought, well, I, I, better, I better tell her. I said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, but uh, there's, a, uh, there's a story which has got you involved in it. And she was like, what? I said, it's all right, I'm the butt of the joke. She went, obviously. I said, well, look, and then I, I kind of, I, I said, look, I'll, I'll run it past you. And I started telling her the basic thing. She was like, yeah, mm, yeah, what? I don't even see what the joke is yet, right? And eventually I got to the point of saying that, look, 
of a melancholy widow. And at that point, her face just lit up and she went, oh, don't worry about that. I've spoken to loads of my friends. Most of us spend a lot of time wondering if we'd be happier if you lot were dead. Anyway, so um, this is what I wanted to talk about, actually, today. But I wanted to talk about positive things. I wanted to talk about uh, the delightful things. By the way, the ramshackle room, I should also say, this is because my shows are very, uh, I, I once did uh, a benefit gig. Uh, it was a benefit gig for, Stuart Lee booked it. It was a benefit gig to buy a new gravestone for William Blake. You see, always niche, Toby, always niche. And uh, I'll tell you what, it was quite amazing. The, uh, the, the they, they, they had uh, the mason there who was making, was actually the funniest person, one of those annoying things at the gig where all the comics went on. But then it turned out it was a really funny mason really good she doesn't normally get the chance to talk and there she was with a chisel and all of the lines but anyway um i had that normal thing where uh like gigs where i have to try and stay focused right i've only got 10 minutes i've only got 10 minutes i've got to stay focused and unfortunately i, I went out there and i was going to do this kind of routine about a brain scan that i'd had but uh, someone in the front row had a t-shirt uh, of a band that i really like from glasgow called the delgado so that led to a kind of there a little bit tangential there and then that led to something else tangential and eventually we end up having this discussion about a fight with jesus and mary chain down socky hall street and then i realized i was 12 minutes into my 10 minutes and i just had to kind of look at my watch but anyway i had a brain scan and everything was fine and then i went back to the dressing room and Stuart Lee just looked to me and he went, you know, you know, why do, you know, why do you, you know, talk about so many things so erratically? You know, why don't you talk about fewer things more specifically? And I think he had a very good point there. And uh, and I said, I said, Stuart, I'm not as clever as you. I'm not as clever as you, you see. I said, you're a very, very clever man. With me, I've got all these ideas in my head. And uh, and then I walk out from the audience and a certain amount of kind of fear suddenly bursts in. And I think, tell them everything. Tell them everything. To hell with structure. To hell with any kind of grammar. Tell them anything. They can do the work afterwards of creating some form of sentences. I said, well, you, Stuart. You, Stuart, you come up with one sentence, and my God, it is a good sentence. Oh, it is such a good sentence. And you say that sentence over and over again for two and a half hours. And Brian Logan goes, yet again, he's changed the entire nature of stand-up comedy. 73 stars. And Stuart went, oh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, I... Um, the th one of, I wanted to also, because I said I wanted to talk about positive things. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention... Well, actually, I was going to say, because... Toby, like me, is a lover of, of the great actors and the, and the interest in the character actors and so many of the kind of, at the moment, talking pictures, talking pictures TV is, uh, is, is a place where many of us are going now, some of the more uh, niche uh, middle-aged individuals to uh, see some Terry Thomas season or go, oh, bloody, that's a Richard Todd film. That's a disappointment. But um, anyway, I was, uh, that was just for you, Toby, by the way. I'm, I'm not a fan of Richard Todd. I wish the rest of the audience could see the face he's just made. He's a big fan of Richard Todd. He probably likes Kenneth Moore as well. He's so very, yeah, the, the smarter amongst us, Leslie Howard and Robert Donat. Thank you. Anyway, I uh, I was uh, I, one of my favourite stories of I, I was going to be doing a show called Satanic Rites of Robin Inns, which I'm not doing. I was going to be at the Manchester Fringe um, in in July. So I just want to tell one story, which I think is a very beautiful story about death. And um, Peter Cushing, one of my favourite actors, and Peter Cushing, of course, was was Doctor Who uh, in the in the Amicus films, and um, he had a quite an idiosyncratic childhood. His mother wanted a girl, so for quite a while he uh, was brought up as a little girl. Uh, in fact, one day he, he went missing and his dad ran the police station and said, have you found a little boy? And uh, they said, no, we've, we've got a little girl here. And he went, could you just check under the dress? And they went, oh, yes, you're quite right. It's a little boy. And uh, there was a beautiful thing, which was uh, he got introduced to death. And of course, a man who then spent so much of his life performing in films that was about the morbid nature of humanity. He was introduced to death because uh, his mother, if he was naughty, would punish him by pretending to be dead. Uh, if he was naughty, he said, if I was naughty and I often was, then my mother would start to sing a song and the song would go, I'm going to go away, away. I'm going across the sea. And I go, please don't die, mummy, please don't die. I promise to be good. But of course, then I'd be naughty again. And then she'd just sit in a chair being dead and I'd be very upset. And my brother would come in and go, don't be so silly, Peter. You know she's not dead. Go on, kick her, shove her. But I couldn't because it was mummy. And then one day when she was being particularly dead, I was so upset and I had a piece of bread covered in marmalade and I just shoved it in her face and she never did it again. 
Do you know, that's just a little bit of uh, advice for you. And the, the, the thing that I will, I, I want to, I, I said I want to talk about things that are delightful and, and, and wonderful. And I, I am lucky, I, I think, at the moment. For, for I know some parents at the moment are, are finding it problematic. I, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I enjoy the adventures I have with my son, and uh, and I am fascinated in in seeing. There's a there's a great thing because I, I think that generation. I'm, if I'll just tell Toby, I think you'll like this, which is um, I like those moments when your children every now and again tell you off, and quite rightly so. Uh, I sometimes buying comics because he loves comics and sometimes I forget the comics some comics are not you know not quite 12 year olds some of the content of the superhero things I bought a comic by Mark Miller some of you might be aware of Mark Miller's work and uh, I hadn't checked it I hadn't checked the contents I just left it for him then went off on tour and two days later I, uh, I rang him up I said hey did you get the comic and he just went dad it was not appropriate um, but I uh, what I want to say with the, the things that I love most of all and again because everyone's over there I've reached a point in middle age where I don't really, I, I don't like things that are too filled with thrills and, and action. I, I am now, I would say my, my favourite things to watch, and I've been watching so much of this in the last two weeks, my favourite things to watch are celebrity narrowboat shows and 24 hours in A&E. That I just love them. I just find them the, the beauty of the celebrity narrowboat shows in particular. They move at a pace that once you're 51 is correct. If you've never seen Timothy Weston Prunella Scales, oh, Timothy Weston Prunella Scales, what wonderful human beings they are. It is literally just basically, it's it's two people moving at a very slow pace, sometimes down the Grand Union, some of the, the more minor uh, canals of, uh, of Britain and, and beyond. And, and it's just Timothy West, just there going... And every now and again, Prunella Scales goes, Tim, didn't we do Merchant of Venice in Peterborough? Yes, we did, Prue. Yes, we did. And that's it. Like that. Now, some people, when I've told them, watch this, they go, not pacey enough for me. I need it pacey, right? Now, those people, I would highly recommend watch the John Sargent ITV narrowboat show, which is half the length. It's 24 minutes long, so it has to be much pacier. So every single show has a level of jeopardy. Now, if you're looking for what I would say is the kind of fast and furious version of that, the best one is there is an episode in which John Sargent, full well knowing that he is going across an aqueduct, buys a new Panama hat. And just the whole episode, about 12 minutes in, because at first we just get to Panama hat, it's a slightly windy day, it's a slightly windy day. And then about 12 minutes in, suddenly there's a bit of a gust and it lifts, it just lifts, and he's still not reached the aqueduct. So that's kind of like the act. And in fact, sometimes I have a dream. My, my, my dream is that one day the two shows will meet. One day there will be a point where John Sargent is going up one way of the Grand Union Canal, Timothy and Prue are coming down the other, and then they meet at a lock, and they are furious. And Timothy West going, come on, come on, John. You know, you know full well that we have the Grand Union on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. You know that, John. You know that. And then John told just they're going, what's that, Timothy West? I can't really hear you. I thought you were classically trained. Can't you project? Fuck you. Fuck you, John Sargent, right? And it just ends up eventually the two of them battling out on a lot with in the background, Prunella Scale shouting, that's it, Tim, kick him in the balls. Anyway, so that's uh, that's what I'm hoping I see at some point. I don't think I've got time to tell you about 24 Hours and Any, but it is such a beautiful show. And I think at this particular time, um, with those, that that just the amount of love in it. And so if you don't mind, I'm just going to end on a little poem that I wrote. I do apologise for ending on poetry. I know it's, one, it's against the rules of excess malarkey, isn't it? But there was, I noticed um, when I was just mucking around my room, there was something that I noticed here, which is a, a comic that hopefully some of you know, Bar Barry Crimmins there. Uh, Barry Crimmins, that's a book by Barry Crimmins, Barry Crimmins who died um, a, a while ago, ne nearly nearly two years ago now. And, and uh, um, no, well, a year and a half, about, but ba Barry Crimmins. And I also thought, I know this is true of Toby, big fan of Neil Innes, wonderful, uh, brilliant musician, wonderful performer, very, very, beautiful human being as well and uh when he died i was thinking about the fact that i'd been fortunate i was fortunate i i i, I met barry and uh I, I met neil and i was thinking about as human beings are kind of sometimes our, our embarrassment and our fear when we meet people that we really admire their work and sometimes we're just a bit arsy or sometimes just so i just wrote this little piece and this was just after uh neil died let me celebrate you now as you stand before me while you can still hear the cheer don't let me wait until you're gone to be fond. Don't let fear of embarrassment stifle my delight. How worry of impending shame leads us to talk about love only when there can be no response. Derision is easily dispensed. Brick that, easier to receive, an acknowledgement of what our self-loathing knew already. We fumble and blush when praised or when praising, waiting to be caught out and rejected. I loved their book. I loved his art. 
I loved her mind, past tense. It's hard not to fear the present, hard to be present, hard not to bend under a cynic stare. Keep the volumes of things unsaid, the regrets of silence as thin as it can be. Let it take little space in the shelf in your head. No need to be ashamed of joy, the giving or receiving of it. Avoid the uselessness of regret. Worry you have been overwhelming with your adoration rather than fear that you have crushed with the negative. And all of that I said in my head as I saw you across the bar. Thank you very much, XS Malarkey, and good night. It was glorious, Robin Ince. Thank you very much. Very uh, fair, inviting a poem on you. Oh, no, I love the poem, and I'm glad that we... Um, because, yeah, because for those those people who are watching, uh, you know, Excess is a Tuesday night gig. It's not, it's not uh, you know, flailing against stag do's and hen do's, is it? We can, we can sort of, we can push the boat out and do different things. And little bits of magic happen, Robin, because one of our heckles via the medium of the internet, which is a thing we have here in Manchester, mm -hmm. um, uh, Ruffy 2K says, I am sitting next to Peter Cushing's great niece. As, oh, as Ruffy I, 2K yes. This. Yes, so, I, 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 if, it's right, if it's the correct great niece, I, 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 I have, uh, have, have met her. But oh, I may, who knows? It might be another great niece because I've, I've, I've met at least one of the great nieces in High Wycombe. So, uh, well, hello. Yeah. I'm sure you have a name as well, but in this corner of the universe, you will be forever Peter Cushing's great niece. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, well, and what a great man. Uh, I've, I've been. Oh, and by the way, Robin, because um, because I've, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people about Peter Cushing, because he was in a lot of the productions that are around Quatermass uh, that were made by the same people. And everybody has exquisitely beautiful stories about Peter Cushing. The sad thing, though, Robin, is that you mentioned Wilfred Bramble. And of course, behind me is a is a Martian from Quatermass and the Pit, which is the only Quatermass series that uh, serial that Wilfred Bramble wasn't in. So um, our, our, our three Quatermass aficionados watching will now be furious uh, <laughs> <laughs> that you invoked Bramble when seeing the, the creek from the one that he, he wasn't in um so so how are you in, how are you enjoying lockdown robin it's all right so far i, I think I, I think it is true to say that it's probably easier for us than it is for those uh, who are not used to having us around quite so much probably um but i i've found it i think like anything when 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 something strange happens the first reaction for some people not for everyone for some people it, it, it's very very difficult and it's and it's uh but i i'm kind of going right what can i do what can i do what can i make out of it yeah, and, and so and and I'm I'm meant to be uh, writing a book, so uh, that now is going to be exactly what happened with the last one, which was will be the mistake of the fact that uh, the hundred and twenty thousand words will now be turning into at least five hundred thousand words, and I reckon I'm going to go through more than three editors this time. Um, but I'm having a lovely time. I'm just kind of uh, I'm making shows in the morning with my friend Josie, Josie Long, and uh, and, and we have guests on every morning. We do do that, so it means it starts the day, and uh, you have that kind of sense of connection. And then I spend the rest of it trying to understand black holes. I normally have a man to do that for me, but he's away at the moment. I can't connect with the man who does my black hole understanding for me. Just because he's in one himself. Yes, the 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 the, the man from Oldham. <laughs> And um, it's interesting because you mentioned about that that snowball thing of you saying you were going to take a break from stand up. But of course, I, I saw that, and then I think I had a chat with you or saw what you were up to. And and you taking a break from stand up is still doing more gigs than <laughs> most people would do in a year. So where's this work ethic of yours come from? Because you're in, I mean, you're nuts. You you uh never seem to stop. I think it's, I mean, that, I did have that last night. I have to admit, I, I know that for, for so many people watching this, that point where you have emptied your entire diary, that that is, uh, I have, uh, last night it really hit me how disconcerting it was not to have to juggle so many different things. And I, and I think the reason that I take on so much is because I know how lazy I am. And I think there's quite a few people who are like that. You are so aware of how easily you can just procrastinate and do nothing that instead you take everything now some people are very good and just go i'm going to do one project i'm going to do it well whereas i make all manner of ham-fisted broken old things and just you know i just keep hammering away and it, you know if you imagine the furniture in my imaginary house you're in my particular mind palace you know it really is rickety i don't put anything on that table don't put a book on that shelf i've made a lot of shelves i've made a lot of tables and all of them are health hazards <laughs> and and since because you it's funny you said that your your stand up isn't your wife's cup of tea, uh, but then it begs the question because you seem to be always what what does she see in you what because because to me that's that's what you you are this whirlwind of stand up invention 
it, it's a question being asked on an hourly basis, I imagine, at the moment. Just just one floor below this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you, you're having to head off somewhere. So what else is it you're doing? Oh, well, I'm, I'm actually still I'm, I'm doing interviews for the, the, the book that I'm working on at the moment. So uh, I'm doing the kind of interviews with people who are in America and stuff. Like that. And, and I've, I'm very, very excited by the fact that uh, there's a, a, a guy who I, I was very lucky to do a show with him in, in Florida and a show with him uh, at, at, when I put on an astronaut show, a guy called Rusty Schweikart, who is from Apollo. He was one of the Apollo 9 astronauts. And uh, I still I, I still find that absolutely ridiculous, the fact that from starting out, you know, you're talking about 23 years, we've known each other for longer than that. You know, I've known you for longer than, than XS Malarkey. And, you know, we were just two people dicking around in clubs and, and the different way that it can go off, whether it's in terms of acting and some of the things that you've done, whether it's into... And I go, oh, somehow dicking around for 20 minutes in clubs in Manchester has led to me now sitting with two astronauts. That's all right, isn't it? That's all right. Yeah. And I mean, the fun thing is all of the, uh, I remember when I first started doing weird science shows and um, not shows about the film weird science. I've never even seen that shows that are weird about science. Sorry. And, uh, that, uh, a lot of people went, why are you doing that? That's going nowhere. And I thought, yeah, but I'm having fun doing it. And then suddenly you find yourself in these odd places. You go, Oh yeah, that idea that has, had no direction to it whatsoever can lead to an enormous amount of kind of joy and delight. Do you remember, I think the first time we, it was one of my first ever paid gigs. Do you remember a gig in Liverpool and it was yeah. Bill Smith, Robin Ince and me. Nobody looked at the bill and went, we need to balance this bill slightly. <laughs> Is the perhaps the European middle-class man mountain here? Um, it, was, it was a bingo hall as well, wasn't it? It was It was normally, a, 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 it was just slightly on the outskirts of, of, of Liverpool, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was, uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that very well. I got I, and I would hate to see any pictures of what we look like. You know that bit where you think, I haven't really aged, and then you see the evidence and you go, oh, oh, to have a face as youthful as Beckett's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would have had a fringe as well. And, yeah, I should have worn the headphones so it covers up a, a myriad of embarrassments. Well, Robin, it's been an absolute pleasure that you've uh, joined us. Thanks for, for, for stopping by. And um, we'll hopefully see you on the live stage when we're all allowed out of confinement but um yeah plug so plug plug uh, plug anything that you've got coming up well, I'll, tell you what, I'll just plug excess malarkey it's one of my favorite clubs in the in, in the country it's an absolute delight i've been playing it for for a very long time and uh and i would also just say go out there and find there are so many artists musicians all manner of people who are creating stuff at the moment and who have no gigs whatsoever and, and for a lot of you know for some people they've got other things that they can do and it's kind of okay for other people this is all that they've got and every kind of week they they would go out and they, they play the clubs and the pubs and sing there or do their jokes there and uh, so find people's work find you know go to band camp go to all of those different places and uh if you can i know a lot of people can't at the moment but if you can try and keep them going and keep that going because when this is all over and done with hopefully we're going to want to go back to the clubs and the little art centers and the strange little social hubs where we can all gather brilliant well robin thank you ever so much uh you're you're, thank you're a star Thanks for joining us. Well, that, that was Robin. Um, I don't know what you can see, everybody, because we have people pressing buttons. But on my computer screen, they've all vanished. So uh, I'm sort of flying solo here, but that's OK. Um, so, but I do have I do have the heckles going. So um, compassionate, Compassion in Flames has sent me uh, a, a heckle saying, have I seen the Dalek in Whitby vid? And am I a little disappointed it hasn't happened in his neighborhood? Yes, I have seen it because every single one of my Facebook friends and Twitter followers has sent it to me because the first thing anybody thought that knows me when they saw that video is, I bet Toby would like to see that. And I've now seen it approximately 5,000 times. Um, so I feel like it has happened uh, in my uh, in, in, in my neighborhood. Um, and I'm, of course, I am grateful that everybody's sent it to me. Uh, oh, and we have a message from Amber's mum. Amber is a... I keep, I always forget the, a comfort dog. That sounds, no, that sounds wrong. Amber is a lovely dog who goes to visit people in hospitals and makes them feel better, but it's not a comfort dog, is it? That's the wrong word. But a something dog, a nice dog, but there's a, there's an official title. There's an official title for nice dog. It's not just a, 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 a chatty adjective, but, but she's a care dog or something like that. So, and she goes into hospitals with ill children and, and adult people in the company. And she, she comes to excess monarchy and she is the most benign presence and and amber has amber's mum says hi toby amber says woof so woof woof amber uh, and we miss seeing you um uh, so look we now what we're doing tonight and every tuesday is we're putting on uh, five acts that we can gather from all the corners of the globe but we want to be true to the live gig as well so uh we, we're trying where we can to make sure 
that um, uh, at least uh, the headline act of, uh, uh, that we were going to have at Excess Malarkey um, can still join us. And I'm delighted that that's the case this evening. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's stamp our feet, let's clap our hands and welcome on to the Excess Malarkey the stage. It's the one and only Olga Kark! sure how many of you are making sourdough, how many of you are making kombucha in your own bathtub. Oh, shit. Um, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's already, it's already fucked up. Oh, no, it's, we're back. We're back. Um, so I would like to talk to you about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk to you about immigration. That's what's on everybody's mind these days, isn't it? Um, and I, would, I, I want to talk to you about, basically, I'm foreign. I don't know if you could tell by my name. It's Olga by my accent, it's American. So my name is Russian, my accent's American. Uh, my vagina is huge. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and in order to stay here in the UK, where I'm staying now, you need to, you need to jump through a couple of hoops, right? Uh, in order to, for them to let you stay. And one of those hoops is a little something uh, called the life in the UK test. Anybody take the life in the UK test? No. There we go, we got one person. <laughs> And um, for those of you who don't, the Life in the UK test is a test um, that you need. You, it's, like, it's like a quiz about living in the UK that has absolutely no grounding in reality whatsoever. If you've met anyone who's taken the Life in the UK test, they've never used any of the information that they learned in the test in daily life. And essentially, it's just a few questions that have to cover all of living in the UK, right? And so they have to combine everything. They'll be like, who are the Beatles? When was World War I? Also, when you move to a new neighborhood, what do you have to do? Do you know what the right answer is? The right answer to the question, what do you have to do when you move to a new neighborhood is introduce yourself to your neighbors. <laughs> That's the least British thing I've ever heard in my life. This is an odd. That's the least British thing I've ever heard in my life. Introduce yourself to your neighbor like a sex offender. How is that the right answer? It is absolutely, it's absolutely nonsense. The only two things that I learned in the whole life of the UK test is that, Bel is that Belfast is the capital of Northern Ireland and that woman walked into Prince Philip's car. Um, <laughs> also, are you timing me? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Someone's timing me. I'm, someone's be taking care of this mess. Don't you worry about it. Um, so yeah, so life in the UK test, really, just, it's a very, very conflicting because I don't think that people who were born in the UK should write the life in the UK right? Because people who are born in the UK don't really understand how weird it is. They can't point it out. They can't write a test. Like adult immigrants should write the life in the UK test because we know how weird all this stuff is, right? Like you were born into Mr. Blobby. I had Mr. Blobby thrust upon me. I should write the test, right? And it's very difficult to come up with something that like unifies all of the UK, right? You will always find an exception. And the UK is such a divided nation on so many things, right? Like Brexit, 50-50, Marmite, 50-50. Boris Johnson's illegitimate children, 50. <laughs> also, I would like to say, I hope he's well. Health to him and his family. He's in our thoughts. <laughs> Did I go too far there? I'm not sure. Some would split the difference. That's how I feel. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it, the, the whole thing also about immigration is insane, right? Because, like, the, they always, like, make this huge, like, show about how it's, like, it's only good immigrants, only good immigrants, only good people, the best people. And, like, the policy is, like, the people who are allowed to be British are, like, the best people in the world. Also, anyone born, right? <laughs> like, it feels like the same way that's, like, my hookup policy is, like, only the hottest dudes, the hottest fucking dudes. Also, anyone in this bar. <laughs> Literally anyone within a two-meter radius, that's fine with me. Two meter. <laughs> No closer than that. No closer than that. Oh, God. It is just bizarre just to talk to my phone that's just held up in the air uh, on a selfie stick that I bought in the year 2015, taped to a chair with some duct tape. That's where I'm at right now. 
I have a university degree. <laughs> and I'm talking to a selfie stick from the year 2015. <laughs> okay, so how much time do I have left? Uh, four minutes. All right, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk about two things fuck out because I'm not here to waste your time. So one of the things I want to talk to you about is late stage capitalism. I don't know if you've heard it. Google it, kids. It's everywhere. And so I, I suppose, I mean, let's do some crowd work. <laughs> let's do some crowd work with two people that live in my house. Um, hey, guys, do you have a favorite cryptocurrency? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. We have one Bitcoin. Bitcoin, sure. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency everybody knows. You know what the best cryptocurrency is, though? Boots Advantage Points. Thank you very much. Why Boots Advantage Points? Okay, think about it. Think about it. Boots Advantage Points are the only way for you to monetize your own health. Think about it, right? Like how much thrush medication do I need to buy to get a free mascara? <laughs> like how much Diarylide do I need to buy to get the crayfish sandwich that gave me the diarrhea in the first place free of charge? <laughs> I'm paying for my pregnancy test with my previous pregnancy scares. I love Boots Advantage Points. It's fucking insane. It's it's the fucking final frontier. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, it's just real sad because like every time I walk past the boots on my daily walk, if there's like a line outside, it's just a bummer. Also, I don't know if you try to buy anything on Boots Online. There's like a virtual queue and the virtual queue is no joke. It's like 200,000 people. It's fucking bleak, y'all. Sorry. This is a comedy gig. We're trying to keep it light. We're trying to keep it light, aren't we? Also, okay, this is genuinely something that I remembered yesterday, and I need to do something with it because it is bizarre. Okay, so basically, my father is a very proud man. How proud, you ask me? This is how proud my dad is. One time, he kept a goose in the oven for too long. It dried out so bad, but he was too proud to admit that it was left for too long. He said it was his signature recipe, and now we have had to have it every year for Christmas. <laughs> Every year. It tastes so bad. Oh, God, I need a break. Um, oh, okay. So I've been walking around my house and just like looking for shit. Uh, just like stuff that I've never thought that I had. Um, turns out, I hope people can hear me. I painted this painting of a dog in sunglasses a couple years back. If anybody wants to buy it from me, I'm going to send it to you. Um, also, what's that? That's me and Bill Clinton. What's that about? That's me. I'm age 11, hanging out with Bill motherfucking Clinton. What? I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, also, a glamour shot of yours truly. <laughs> Do we like that? Do we like a little bit of that? Who is she? Who is she? I mean, that's a sexy child. <laughs> I can say that because I am the child. So that's fine. Um, Bill Clinton talks also too, so uh, just saying. Um, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so there's too much stuff. Okay, so basically, I need to tell you this. I've recently gone through a breakup. It's fine. I'm fine. By fine, I mean I um, bought myself a ukulele on Amazon. <laughs> uh, and now I can play a version of Get Lucky. Even white people don't. Know. So. <laughs> Right after uh, breakups, we all like to go on a little something I like to call a sexual safari. Uh, that's when you like fuck everyone you can uh, to kind of fuck the sad out of yourself, right? We've all done that, right? And like, it sounds cool, but nine out of 10 times you bring a guy home and instead of having sex, he tells you about his dead dog. Um, and like, I get that because you need to say something sad in order to, for the one night stand to be good because you need to like create an illusion of intimacy by telling each other a secret. But like the trick is for the secret to be like sad enough to be like, my dog is dead, but not so sad that it's like I killed my dog, right? <laughs> because I'm not going to fuck a dog kill, right? I'm like I'll suck your dick, but like I have some self-respect. So in my mighty and great sexual safari, uh, I resolved uh, to have sex. Olga has frozen, so I'm talking to fill in time and oh, to no. show. Oh, ah, you've unfrozen. What was the last thing I said? Yeah. Oh my god, but wait. Yeah. So, is, do we talk about sucking your own dick? You, you, 
I, I think you were just about to. John can suck his own dick. <laughs> no, no, I get it. Uh, so are we, should I continue? Hello? Yes, okay, I'm gonna, continue. I'm gonna look at, basically, my friend John can suck his own dick. That's all you need to know. How do I know? <laughs> <laughs> How do I know? Right, should I continue? Am I frozen? Continue, continue. You're not frozen. John can suck his own dick, Toby. I don't know. <laughs> and admire you and all the work that you do. I really do. But I need to get back to John sucking his own dick. So, John can suck his own dick. How do I know? John and I were trying to have sex and then we were like, oh, we're too good of friends. We can't do this. So then he looked at me and he says, do you want to see something cool? <laughs> Obviously, I said yes. And that is how I learned how John can suck his own dick. You know, the second thing about John is, the second thing is that uh, his parents bought him Weird Al versions of songs. So he thinks those are the original. <laughs> um, wonderful dude. Anyway, so right now uh, I'm going to show you how you can suck your own dick in the privacy of your own home because you're locked up in Corona. What else are you going to do? Uh, may I have a beautiful volunteer, please? Uh, please welcome to the stage, Philip. Philip is my flatmate. Philip is bringing a yoga mat because this is not for the. This is this is this is some really next level shit. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Um, this is Philip. Um, okay, so I think. Can you, leave, do you mind, oh yeah, a little bit of this? Okay, we can see Phil, great, fantastic. Okay, so this is how you suck your own dick, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so basically, um, and those who don't identify as either, everyone is welcome to next to the Okay, wait, I need to show, show, show people. Turn around, turn around. I am the wall, he's lying down. You throw your legs on the wall and you walk yourself into your own mouth, okay? <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Bella. <laughs> A couple of things that you need to know before I say goodbye. First of all, you will have noticed that Phil was using his arms to balance himself, which means that he can't use his hand to put the penis in his mouth. So something that's tattooed in my brain for the rest of my life is John going. <laughs> that's one. And the second thing is I asked John, John, what does it feel like to suck your own dick? He looked at me and he breathed really heavily. And then he said, well, you think it's going to feel like getting your dick sucked, but it really feels like sucking someone's dick. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a wonderful quarantine. I've been old guy. I'm sorry I froze. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Can I have some flowers? I have some flowers. Yeah, there we go. Myself. Hi. Unmute. Hello, Olga. Thank <laughs> well, um, well, thank you for that. How was it performing to an audience of two? Um, honestly, I wish that's what all of our interactions. Sometimes I have to listen to them talk and it's really a bummer. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, uh, amusingly, um, if John uh, did uh, only get songs that we, we had Al Yankovic versions, we had Al Yankovic's version of Beat It was actually called Eat It. So that's yes! really why he learned to do the thing that he learned to do. <laughs> It was clearly an instruction. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> you can have that, love. Um, so, um, uh, how uh, how are you coping? Uh, so so you're, you're with your flatmates. We saw Phil there. Um, yeah. So you're, you're there's three of you in the in the in the flats. Uh, we're having a lovely time. We're cooking a lot. We're cooking too much, if anything. Yeah. What's the best thing you've cooked? Oh God, I made queso, which is. Just liquid cheese. I don't. I, I. I. I don't know if that's cooking less so than it is just melting cheese and saying it's a dish. Oh man! Like I mean, now that you are forcing me to articulate this, it's much bleaker than I thought it was. <laughs> oh god. And uh, and what are your what are your plans for when uh, we're all unlocked again? Were you you were going to Edinburgh this year? Were you I was, but obviously not anymore. Yeah. Um, but I guess, I mean, my plan is to have a lot of just like platonic kissing and hugging with literally everyone I see on the street. Dogs, people, <laughs> children, seniors, just everyone. I just want to kiss everyone on the mouth. Licking people's eyeballs, that sort of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you were supposed to be at Excess Malarkey live tonight. tonight. 
Yeah. Yeah. I had an easy hotel room booked. Did you get a refund? I have I I have it uh, rescheduled to any date I want. So if you ever want to see me again, just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will. <laughs> Once we're all allowed out again. Um, and are you doing any further things online that the audience can uh, can find you doing? Yeah, if any, if, if people could just uh, follow me on Twitter at Rock and Rollga, everything you need to know will be there. If you are feeling something like a little less snarky and a little more vulnerable, then I'm on Instagram at Kolga300, where it's just a more of like a like a stripped down acoustic version of me. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me, I don't think I've cracked Instagram, Olga. You're young and with it. What is the secret to Instagram? Because it seems to me that pic pictures tell a thousand words, but a thousand words tell the words better. <laughs> <laughs> I think a trick with Instagram is to be so brutally honest to the point where people assume you're kidding. Right. Oh, okay. God. So I have I have to be. Oh, get, okay. Yes, you could go on and you could be like, I just shit myself, and people are like, that can't be true. This is hilarious. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, if I if I shared my thoughts, it might be a bit alarming. But okay, we'll see. We'll see. Um, well, look, Olga. I don't know if you're going to stick around because sometimes people come back at the end and all of that sort of thing. But for now. Uh, Olga, who would have been on stage, but has joined us in cyberspace. Olga Kopp, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so, so oh. much. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Olga. Yay. Well, um, I've got a couple more. I've got a couple more of the questions from the audience. Uh, Hurricane Roz has said, has shouted out from the back like a, a drunken office party reveler. Um, what's the first thing you'll do when we're all free? Uh, the first thing I will do is lock the doors and let you all go out and do the things that uh, Olga was describing. Because I tend to go to the park now with the dog when it's evening and there's nobody around. And it's like I sort of fantasise the world to be when I when I fantasise about, I don't know if you've ever seen a series called Survivors, where most of the world's population are wiped out. And I imagine getting a cottage and making my own wine and uh, occasionally threatening passing strangers with a shotgun. And I think I'd essentially be happier then. So um, this is my moment. And when when you're all free, I shall uh, I shall retire back to my own cellar and fantasies. Now uh, we've had an American act who lives over here. Now one of the things that prevents acts from playing excess malarkey is huge success that rips them from our womb and uh, and thrusts them mewling and puking into another continent. Uh, and this next act has done excess malarkey so many times, but not recently because uh, he lives in that there uh, Los Angeles. So uh, he's now, for the first time in ages, uh, able to play the gig. And so what a delight that he said hello. So please stamp your feet, clap your hands, and give a big warm welcome for our next act of the evening. It's only Mr. Matt Kirshen. Yay! Yay! Thank, thank you, Toby. That's perfect timing. But that was my fiance right at the moment you introduced me, dropping a pile of metal things. That's that's one of the things that happens when you do a gig from home. Uh, we've already tried to mitigate some noise by locking the cat in the hallway, which is something I learned from the previous time I tried to do one of these gigs from here, uh, where it turns out there's nothing more enticing to a cat than this whole setup here right now. There's currently a laptop balanced on a box, balanced on a stool, with a separate microphone balance there, and everything about it just screams like attack this. Uh, this is, but also Toby. By the way, uh, thanks for the. It, it's also lovely as an intro to go like he's got onto huge success, and then you instantly cut to my living room where you can see clearly that's not the case. It's uh, that's one of the, one of the things. Oh, look at this beautiful poolside cabana that I'm clearly broadcasting from, and not just. A living room next to a nook that's also that's the office behind that curtain is the office and then just in front of the curtain is the rest of the apartment that's what we're that's what we're de dealing with right now um i i said fiance it meant to be my wife very soon but th now there's a pandemic so <laughs> like like that that's all maybe we'll work it out it'll happen at some point we're uh it's probably still going to happen. May it happen at the time? I don't know. We, we were going to be getting married on the 13th, not this 13th, a few 13ths from now, which multiple friends, by the way, 
have said like, oh, you're sure? That means that your wedding anniversary is going to be on like seven, every seven years, it's going to be on Friday the 13th. And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. Cause uh, neither my fiance nor I are 15th century villagers. Uh, we don't live our life according to the movements of crows. Omens have very little bearing on our existence. If, if we don't need a bountiful harvest this autumn, if we run out of food, we press a thing on our phone and more food comes. That's how we exist. E even right now, even in a pandemic, that still happens. It's a remarkable world we live in these days. Uh, it was, I don't know how many of you have planned I don't know how many of you plan weddings or gone through weddings. I, I won't lie. A little bit of me is grateful for the break. I know this is obviously a horrendous global tragedy and a lot of people are in pain right now, but God, it's nice to not have to deal with a wedding contract for a few months. Like it's no deposit, like the amount of money, like the stuff you have to pay for at a wedding, the, the cost of flowers. You know how much flowers are for? I bought flowers from the supermarket before they're like a ten or a bunch i figured five of those were good uh i voiced that opinion apparently you're not meant to be getting the tenner bunches but uh it's um oh my god it, it's it's like four figures we just got quoted for flowers so the three figures for the bouquet the bouquet is three figures and then she throws it you are not throwing that we're spending three figures on a bouquet. You're not throwing it. Take a picture of it on an iPad. You can throw that. It's cheaper. Uh, I um, uh, I've just realized Toby and Ros are both muted as well, whereas they weren't beforehand for Olga. I thought I was just doing really badly with them. You can unmute yourselves. It's fine. It's nice to hear two people kind of laughing. Oh, I can barely I can barely hear you. I turned you down so that there wasn't there wasn't reverb. But I can I can see your beautiful faces now. I uh um no, I've got I I started all of these little processes. I uh I gone ring shopping. I was I was midway through ring shopping for me when we had to, when all the shops closed down. Uh, I'd never done that before. I'm not a ring person. I don't wear rings. I I had no idea how emasculating that process might be. Uh, apparently, I have very slender fingers that's something i've been told by multiple jewelers now like one after the other you're just going in oh you got very slim fingers there i can double up if needed <laughs> hopefully it won't impact our wedded life too badly does it still count can she still get on my health insurance someone Someone on the chat, I've got the Twitch chat open. Someone has just commented, you have a slender neck too, which I don't even know what that means now. Is that going to affect the tie that I have to get married in as well? <laughs> Are you going for like neck rings? Are we going for more of a sort of National Geographic type wedding? <laughs> oh, someone also said getting married is ace. It's our 10 year this weekend. Well, congratulations on both your 10 year anniversary and being happy enough to be quarantined with that person. Because I assume you are, unless you're like, also married over Zoom chat. Well done, you. I quite like this having like the little chat stream I can refer to. It's very enjoyable. How uh, it's uh. Now, now someone shouting, "You're my favorite 15th century villager." Can I have an iPad? And I say shouting because that's all in caps, which means either you really want me to see that message or you don't know where the caps lock is. And either way, I like, this is, a, this is what I, I haven't done excess malarkey in years. Like, like Toby said at the beginning in introduction, uh, I haven't done it. I haven't done it since it changed venues. Uh, if that helps date it, I like this new venue we're in right now. It's very enjoyable. I, I, I did, I did a zoom gig last week that got ruined by zoom bombing, which is a thing where a, a internet troll jumps on and takes over the screen because they didn't have the settings locked down and starts writing racist stuff, which that's a fun experience. That's something you don't have to deal with. Like, you, you know, I've been doing this for long enough to deal with every kind of in-person heckle you can deal with, but normally someone doesn't take over the entire image of the stage. You don't disappear and get replaced by the heckler. And then you're like, how do I deal? I know how to deal with in-person hecklers. I know how to handle them generally. I know it's often caused by, you know, alcohol or or maybe you know someone who wants to impress his workmates and doesn't know how to do it properly. But 
when it's an internet troll, you're like, oh God, how do I deal with this? Because you might be just someone who needs to be put in their place, or this might be the first step on a ladder to becoming a school shooter. And you, you, you know, you don't know how far in to go. It's, uh, it's it, this whole situation is a mixture between heartwarming stories and horror stories. I saw something this morning where a lot of the doctors and nurses who are treating people are now, because they're in the full protective gear, they're putting photos of their faces printed out on, on their stomach so that people, like on their chest, so people can see who it is treating them behind the mask, which is a very lovely, heartwarming thing, but also makes them look like horrifying Teletubbies, this sort of pandemic kid show. Um, trying to... We're, we're trying to support the local restaurants as well. We're lucky we're in a nice area where there's a lot of options. I don't eat meat, so my options are more restricted. Although I, w I will say, I will say, even as a non-meat eater, I will say the fake meat scientists have gone too far. They, they nailed it a few years ago in the fake meat world, then they kept going, and now it's weird. <laughs> there, are, there are competing brands of fake meat burger out there that are like, this is so realistic, it bleeds. And that's not what I was missing. <laughs> oh, can you get the bleeding back? The one thing I yearned for from my earlier meat eating days. Can you do that fake meat scientist? Can you recreate the horrifying mouthfeel of blood with just pea protein and beet juice? Can you, <laughs> can you do that? Can you make a slaughterhouse in my face with your chemical wizardry? Fake meat scientist. Can you do that? It's like, it's like, try these real sex dolls. They cry. <laughs> they get incredibly upset before, during and after they were, programmed by the fake meat scientists to be horrifyingly real. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. I know you've started to get them in the UK as well. They've been out here for a year or two. They, they started in a few fancy restaurants and then they, but now they're like, even like the fast food chains have started to get them. Um, you know, a chain called Carl's Jr. That's got the Beyond Burger. Burger King has it. Burger King's got the impossible burger now. That's their big marketing push the last few months. Uh, that and depression. Uh, that's, that's a real thing. Uh, I, I don't know if you saw this. I know it went over to the UK as well because it went globally viral. They, they, Burger King put out what they hoped would be a viral advert, which it was, but for the wrong reasons. Uh, it was this minute and a half long web video that was just like, hey, I get depressed sometimes and that's okay. Burger King. And that, that was the whole advert. People were like, well, well, how did you expect this to work for you? What was the intention? Talk me through this process. Like it was, people got really angry. It was one of those 24 hour Twitter outrage bubbles where they're like, how dare you, Burger King? How dare you? This depression is a really serious issue and you're just using it for marketing. What, what do corporations think they can do this? This is like the the Pepsi, Kendall Jenner, Black Lives Matter advert a few years earlier. What do, what do corporations think they can use these serious social issues just to push their product? I'll tell you why. Because it nearly always works. Like nearly always. In fact, like twice in four years. And every other time when a company is like, hey, don't punch gay people. Barclays. Or whatever. People are like, oh, well done. But thank you. Finally. Fi <laughs> All the blogs get involved. Like, look at this brave financial institution putting a stop to homophobia. The world is a better place <laughs> thanks to this. Right. Hey, there's a festival in Spain where they throw a live goat out of a church tower. And we disapprove of that. <laughs> whole gate. Like, honey, we're switching toothpaste brands. <laughs> we're, we're going away from the ones that approve of goat tower murder. <laughs> By the way, that's a, I didn't make that up. That's a real festival. I made up the brand connection to both those things, but that's a real festival that exists. Like it's a Spanish festival. You can look it up and they throw a live goat out of a tower and catch it on a blanket. Uh, and it commemorates a time that a goat jumped out of the tower supposedly and survived. It's like the, it's like the Spanish goat Hanukkah. And, 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 and we're doing this for you. I know Toby's looking horrified because it, it was, but, you know, we, we live not too far from Spain. We know that they are phenomenal people who have the most curious attitude towards animal welfare. <laughs> the country that brought us bullfighting did not stop there. They, they really have some strange ideas and they push it. Uh, and this festival exists and they did it for years. And eventually the animal rights people got in, like, they got too much of a thing. And they were like, all right, all right, we will stop doing that. So instead they took a goat to the top of the tower 
and lowered it in a harness. Like, <laughs> Like, that's the Spanish. Phenomenal people. They're like, look, a goat has to get from the top of the tower to the bottom somehow. And if you can think of a better way, I'm all ears. But until then, get the pulley. Uh, and and then and then someone went, well, what if we just throw, like, a stuffed toy goat out of the tower and caught it? And then they were like, oh, yeah, that's a much better idea. So then, then that's what they did. That So that, that's... That's the new festival, which is great, but it still means kids, little Spanish kids in this town square have to watch this happen with a toy. And they're like, mom, dad, why are they throwing the toy goat out of the tower? And and the parents are like, well, because they used to throw a real live goat out. And then it was decided that that was cruel. And the kids are like, oh, was that like hundreds of years ago? And they're like, no, 2004. <laughs> Very recent. Like post Jonas Brothers. It was <laughs> far sooner than it should. I just noticed someone in the comments saying they did the plush goat in 2014. But yeah, they did. Yeah, they did, Krizu. That's exactly what they did. It's uh um I I probably I probably should be wrapping this up at some point. Uh it's it's hard to know exactly uh you know when to finish on a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, you build up to a crescendo and you're like, I'm going to finish on a big laugh from Toby and Roz. That's, <laughs> that, that's when to really kick it in. Oh, it's it's raining outside as well. The one thing you come to L.A. for is good weather. And now it's pissing with rain. Um, like, a, uh, oh, God, I, uh, I'll, t I'll tell you one last thing. I, I, I'll tell you because I know I know people are stuck in with their kids and uh Someone saying nice LA job. It was already mentioned at the beginning. Hannah Cox, only Hannah Cox. We already knew that. That's where I am now. Uh, I might as well be anywhere in the world. There's no reason for me to be here at, whatsoever. I could be on a farm somewhere it, with space and animals running around rather than one murderous cat that's got to be locked in the hallway away from us. I've got, I don't know if you can see the scars on my arm from this creature. Um, God, I feel for the people who are stuck with their kids now as well. Oh, the kids, God, what a weird, awkward, awkward, strange summer. Because I remember awkward, having an awkward childhood, but nothing like that. And I was an awkward kid. I was I, I was small and nerdy and bad at sports, and none of that has to be in the past tense, as as opposed to the brute of a man that now looms over all of you. Look at look at this. Look at look at this brutish, powerful husk of a, a jock that's currently imposing on your screen i was i was i was long-sighted I, I i wore glasses for that i had a lazy eye i don't know if you know the treatment for a lazy eye it's a patch that's what they do they put a patch over the other non-lazy eye to make the lazy one not lazy that that's it that's the best that science has come up with in the 21st century like still 2020 that's still what they do i checked that's still that, like the year of good eyesight that's still what they do that's like something a victorian nanny would have come up with like, oh, don't help it. Don't help the other eye. It'll never learn. Uh, it, and your parents try and play it off as a good thing. That's the job of parents. I know there are parents right now trying to make everything good for their kids. That's the job of parents is to lie to your kids as much as possible to cheer them. Up. Oh, look at you, you lucky thing. You get to have an eye patch. That's cool, isn't it? Oh, aren't you lucky? No one else has an eye patch. You're the only one in your school. You're literally the only one. Always good to look different as a kid. The other school children love the different child with something stuck on their face that no one else has. That's what I had, this, this big leftover plaster thing stuck on my foot. But, um, like, stuck, by the way, slapped on the front of my glasses as well, as if it wasn't bad enough. Like, just really accessorize that. You know the huge plaster? You know the huge Band-Aid, the plaster, the one that you've never used? That's what I had as a kid. You know the, you know the one from the variety pack? that you would never use because of any injury big enough to need to be covered by it, too severe for a plaster. Who's using that? Thank you, Stephen 7 H patch solidarity. Who's using that? We're like, oh my God, I've been shot. I've been shot. Get the big plaster. We're going to need the big, rip it off the kid's face. Get it off the squinty kid's face. I'd be, I need two. Give me two squinty kids, one for the exit wound, one for the entrance. I've asked around as well, by the way. I've asked around. Thank you, Stephen. Did you have the plain beige patch, the beige eye patch, like plaster thing? That's what I had. The, um, because I've asked around, most people had that. Some people had the full pirate decorative, like like skull and crossbones. I'm jealous of those kids. Uh, some kids, I found out, 
uh, from surveying various audiences around had parents who thought they were helping them by disguising the eye patch by covering it with a sticker of an eye. As if that's not terrifying. Like, off you go with your single unblinking eye. Go and run off now. Run off with your one eye that moves around. The other one looks like it can see through time. Act normal. Make friends. Uh, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn you back over to Toby now and turn the volume up so I can hear them. But thank you so much. I've been Matt Kirshen. I appreciate this excess malarkey. I always appreciate you. Matt Kirshen, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Tobes. Um, I, that was fascinating stuff. Um, I, I presume, I'm hoping that the goat that gets chucked out of the window is now made of um, pea protein and beetroot so that it, <laughs> it does actually bleed. Um, well, look, and I noticed that you said uh, beet instead of beetroot. So obviously, I did. Goat. That just slipped out. I, I've been translating as I go along and then suddenly went all American for that one line. Good catch. So, um, well, for the so how long have you been in? in oh, and by the way, Hannah Cox. He was being geographically accurate. He wasn't boasting. Uh, <laughs> some, a bunch person. of people, I can see on the chat, by the way, a bunch of people are saying cat, please. I don't know. Holly, can you release the cat? See what happens. Let's see the cat. Now, now I can guard. Let, let's see if he runs in. So, so, so what you've learned for the future is that any future gigs... Um, it's somehow conceited to mention where you actually are. <laughs> Pretend you're in Doncaster, and then people won't judge you. <laughs> I know, right? Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, how, how, what's it like being an Englishman in, if not New York, uh, uh, LA? Um, it, how, it's how mostly lovely. It, it's mo apart, from, like right now, obviously, it's very strange. And also, we're we're about two weeks ahead of you in terms of quarantining. So we were. Uh, I thought you meant in terms of how the time difference works. Yeah, we're also two weeks in the future. So just if you want to know any stocks or shares or gambling tips, I've got all the information here. Uh, it's um, mostly it's lovely. You know, it's all very sunny, and people like people seem to think this accent makes you smarter and more charming than you actually are. Oh, hang on, I've got. Here we go. Here we go. Here's here's this nightmare. Hello, what's what's the nightmare called? This is Doug. This is Douglas the cat. Hey, Douglas the cat. Ah. Oh. <laughs> um. But yeah, it's it's mostly it's mostly lovely. It's a uh, it's a thoroughly. There's a few of us Brits out here now. There's a few knocking around. Is there? Is there? A, and you all hang around together. We'll we'll occasionally meet up and reminisce and talk about. Oh, here he goes. All right, he's off. Uh. Uh. Talk about the nice gigs such as yourself and uh, and the terrifying ones that we've also done. Well, I think the last time I saw you, Matt, was at um, uh, Baby Blue in Liverpool, a gig that's no longer with us, sadly. Uh, uh, do you remember the one down a flight of stairs? Oh, I remember it well. It was that, that, that gig very much it, on the Liverpool docks, and it had the uh, it had the ability to be either a fantastic gig or the kind of gig that would make you reassess your entire existence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and also, I seem to remember the, the toilet area had a sewage plumbing problem where it always had this horrible smell, and rather than sort of sorting out the plumbing, instead they just employed a man to stand there and occasionally spray it with an air freshener. Yeah, yeah, and well, and he peddled, he peddled perfume, so I, I'm not sure it wasn't a scam, you know. <laughs> God, I smell of sewage. Give me some cool <laughs> food. Uh, yes, I remember that man. He was a delightful fellow. Um, uh, yeah, but it was, uh, yeah, sadly that gig has gone though. So uh, what's the live circuit like out there? there? There isn't really a live circuit in the same way. It's because it, it's such a, di LA, you just do all these sort of short spots in different, in like clubs like the Improv or the Comedy Store. And then if you actually want to sort of do comedy to make money, you have to go on the road. But in America, the road, it's not like here where, you know, I could drive up to Access Malarkey and then do a gig and then drive back the same night and be like, uh, and consider that a long commute. You know, if you have a gig in Michigan, you basically have to get on a plane and be there for four days. Otherwise, it's not worthwhile. So that that's what the circuit's like. I, I You know, you fly out to somewhere and you're there for almost a, the best part of a week. And then you fly back on the Monday morning. So you you don't... Have the proper stand-up experience of eating a Ginsters pasty in a service station at two o'clock in the morning. No, instead you have the experience of uh, eating in a lot of airport restaurants and cafes, and then the experience of spending 
Like sometimes you're you're somewhere which is like in a city and you can walk to places to get food. But the other thing is in America, you'll sometimes be in a hotel and a comedy club that are just next to nothing. Like you don't you don't have um, Britain doesn't have nothing in the same way America has nothing. Like there are areas, you know, in, in Britain, even if you think you're in the middle of nowhere, if you walk for too long in one direction, someone will tell you to get out off their grass. You know, it just, it, <laughs> like, it, you, you know, you could think you can't get lost in Britain in the same way. Someone will be like, that's, that's, that's mine. Uh, but you can be like on the, in this roadside restaurant where I, or, or a hotel where you're in the hotel and then you'll see the, the only food place for miles away will be like a jack in the box fast food place that's on the other side of the road. But that road is a highway and the place has not been designed in any way to accommodate anyone who doesn't have a car. So, so it's like there, you could almost throw a paper airplane and hit it, or you can walk for 45 minutes around the entire town to find the one crossing point where you can get over this highway and get into get this fairly mediocre fast food. So it, you get, all, it's, it's like that. that. That's the weird, lonely version of the 2 a.m. welcome break stop. Well, it's interesting because uh, I'm going to drop an L.A. bomb now because I've, I've been to L.A. I, was, I did a Doctor Who convention there um, one, one Valentine's weekend. All the Doctor Ooh. Who fans were available. And um, uh, we, I, like you, am not a meat eater. And I was surprised to discover that when I, said this you know they told well you can't have the potato salad i thought what what can possibly how can you possibly get meat into a potato salad oh we put bacon in that um yeah. and then we, we were there no i was in chicago for thanksgiving and they laid on a lovely spread and i got the, the veggie version which was basically you go up with your plate you don't have any of the meat but you can have most of the vegetables although the cauliflower cheese of course had bacon in <laughs> <laughs> but what what surprised me was for a nation that's very big on on god is that they haven't trusted God to make vegetables tasty enough without them adding all sorts of things to them. So the, the Brussels sprouts were coated in sort of honey glaze, yep. uh, balsamic vinegar. The carrots were in honey glaze. The, the, the broccoli was in cheese. The asparagus was in hollandaise sauce. It's just like, we've got all these things that got... Yeah, the peas will have ham in it. But yeah, we'll make them lethal. Um, and my <laughs> favourite was the sweet potato, which by its nature and indeed name is plenty sweet enough, which was put marshmallow on top. Yep. So you're, you're clearly not eating anything there because you still no. change your natural shape. I don't know. I don't know. This is, I've, I've, I've intentionally cropped below here. <laughs> like the, the alternative was to paint, paint a face on the stomach and do the gig that way. But it was just a bit too much effort. You know, there's only so much effort you can go to in these quarantine times. Well, I hope you're enjoying it there, Matt. And it's so delightful that, uh, out of something oh. terrible must come something great, which is the it, fact that you've been able to play Excess Malarkey once again. It, it's such a joy to get to do it. It's, you've always been one of my favorite shows. It's a, I, I did you? I, I think 2003 was when I first did a show for you guys. It was one of my first out of town gigs. Yeah, yeah. At Remedy at the big at the big bar Remedy it was called. Yeah, then it became bar. That's Remedy. it. Oh well, bless you, Matt. Well, uh, we, I don't know if we're seeing you at the end or or not, but for now, Matt Kershaw. Oh. Tobes, could I uh, can I possibly chuck in a tiny plug for my podcast while you've got internet people? Yes, please do. Sorry, yes. No, no, it's, it's cool, cool. But yeah, if anyone's a podcast listener, I've got a show called Probably Science, where we go through the week in science news with comedians. And if you just if you just find Probably Science on any of your podcast listeners, sometimes we have real scientists on, but normally we just have comics and we're muddling through the science news of the week. Excellent. And, uh, uh, I would love it if you could if you could check that out if you're looking for a podcast to listen to in these times. Well, I think everybody is, so that's great because um, uh, I'll add it because I've just got to the end of Serial, so I need something. So. Lovely. Also, I'm not I'm enjoying people in the chat fact checking the goat story and coming up with the actual years rather than the years I plucked out of my ass. 2003 pre plush goat. Thank you, Krizu. Really appreciate that. <laughs> Krizu is like the York notes of the gig, <laughs> breaking it down into salient points. But yeah, um, thank you so much, Toby. Appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. And well done for being brave enough to have the comments on. I certainly wouldn't do that. Um, so uh, I have to give a big shout out because what one of the things we do at Excess is before the show, uh, it's always been a habit of ours, is to have cult TV themes playing because um, uh, because it's my gig and I like cult TV. And there's nowhere else you can play cult TV themes apart from if in a place that you've built and uh, I didn't build it obviously but um i, I, I bought a cd 
which is sort of the equivalent. Um, uh, but because we we uh, uh, we're we're adapting at what we do slightly for uh, the television, which is what you're watching us on. Um, uh, uh, Jay, who is one of the uh, vital members of the Excess Malarkey behind stage team. By the way, if you want to know what they look like, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing a show called Excess Malarchive, where we play uh, previous shows that we've done. And because we can't illustrate them with with uh, well, we know we can. We've got, we we sort of have pictures of the acts, but we also have us reacting uh, to them by way of sort of visual placeholders. And that's where you will see Roz and Jay and John and Hannah and uh, uh, and Joe and whoever else from the sort of excess malarkey uh, backstage crew, if you want to see what they look like. I sort of prefer a bit of mystery, so I actually don't know what any of them look like because uh, I, I, I just I, I make them put bags on their heads until I've stopped staring at them. Um, but Jay ha has began the show um, by tinkling our TV themes on the piano, uh, and it was rather marvellous. So uh, before the show starts at eight o'clock, if you want piano renditions of classic TV themes, that's what uh, Jay was doing uh, earlier. And I thought it was, again, something rather lovely and different that we're doing for this TV show. Now, we have an act that uh, I am delighted. I'm slightly worried that he's not, but is, I'm going to be delighted to welcome onto the excess uh, malarkey stage. The first time he played excess malarkey, I'd actually just had a letter from his granddad. We won't get into why that was, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's one of those uh, lovely little surprises and connections that uh, sometimes happen. Ladies and gentlemen, the current, the reigning champion of, uh, of, of comedy brilliance uh, from the Edinburgh Fringe uh, and a favourite act of ours who's done many Edinburgh previews of the shows that he's then gone and have great success with. Uh, so um, it's a delight that he's joining us now. Please stamp your feet, clap your hands, dragons and wyverns together. Welcome onto your cyber stage, Mr. Jordan Brooks. Yay! Wow. Thank you so much. I hope you can all hear me okay. I hope, uh, hope I'm, yeah, lovely stuff. Um, so why, 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 can I, why can I still see Toby's uh, face on the big screen? Is that, do I have to watch you? Do I have to perform to you, Toby? Is that why you're on the screen? I don't know. It's very irritating. Not irritating. It's not, <laughs> like, it's not, I'm not angry, but like, like th there is a time limit on when that might not be the case. Uh, right. How do we, uh, how do we make me the big, the big boy? Okay. That's better. Is that better? Thank you. All right. What a treat. All right. All right, guys. Well, that's my time. Thank you so much for, um, so, uh, yeah, I hope you. I hope you're well. I hope you're okay. I hope you. I hope you're coping. I hope. Um, I hope you've got people around you. I've. I've got my flatmate Luke with me. Here's Luke. Can you say hello? Hello. There he is. He's just sank a uh, gin and barocca. So you know. Um, I hope you. I hope you said hello when I said hello. Like I hope. I hope you said it out loud because it's a shame if you didn't. Do you know what I mean? Like, it'd be nice if you said it out loud. Like, I, obviously, I'll never know if you said it out. But I might say it. I'll say it again. And then if you if you say hello out loud, that would be really nice. If you don't, if you choose not to, then you're just watching me make myself vulnerable for you. And you're not, like, meeting me halfway. So <laughs> it would be really nice. And obviously, I'll never know. I'll never know. But you will know. You will know <laughs> whether you said hello. Whether you did that, whether you took that risk, whether you allowed yourself to connect with someone ever so briefly. So, hello. Right, if any of you fucking didn't, I swear, I swear to God, I'm gonna, I'll lose my fucking shit. Um, Robin, uh, Robin showed you around his flat, all his books and, and stuff. He's a very, cult, very cultured man, very cultured man. Uh, what have I got? Okay. Pen. Lighter. Empty bottle of rum. <laughs> Tea bag. Uh, this old thing. <laughs> um, I think that's it. That's, that's, that's the, that's the whole, that's the whole lot. That's, that's my entire life right there. <laughs> Spread out. Uh, <laughs> like evidence as if I'm on trial for being a uh, braggart. So what? So I don't. I can't do my. It's really hard for me to do my act. So I'm, what? What I've been obviously. I'm sure 
I'm sure you've all been spending a lot of time reflecting on yourselves, reflecting on your pasts. Um, I, so I've got a couple of, but I wrote a couple of books when I was a child. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? Self-published. Self-published, but um, did write them. This one is, doesn't have a spine. It's just a pile of papers. So I wrote. Um, I'll, re I'll do some readings from like from two of them, and maybe that will be the maybe that will fill the the, the void. Uh, time. I mean time. Okay. So right, I'll read from the. I'll read, I'll read from this one that I wrote when I was twelve years old, right? And then I'll read from this other one that's a bit more elaborate. So uh, <laughs> I won't read you the whole thing, but I'll just read you the opening paragraph. And it should tell you everything you need to know about what was happening in my life at that time. Okay. This is the first sentence. This is the first sentence. The book is called The Haunting of St. Lawrence School. And on the back, it's uh, published by J.B. Brooks. Uh, books. Uh, other books in the series, actually, I've written some other books in the series. So what we've got here is one, spooky horror tales. Two, the adventure. Three, the comedy book. Come on, mate, wind it in. Four, Animal Town. Five, The Great Book of Footy. Six, Man United Book. Seven, The Great Book of Tennis. So, there you go. Uh, none of them made it to print, actually. Right, here's the first sentence. Here's the first sentence of this. Story. I'll just read the first paragraph. Here we go. I didn't like my new school. It gave me the creeps. My mum had had enough of Liverpool, so she wants to live somewhere else. I told her, I don't want to go and live here. But no, it wasn't working. I knew I was going to have to put up with it for a long time. My new school was terrible. I couldn't stand it. Anyway, my name's Jordan. I've not made any friends yet, but I'm sure I will sooner or later. So the story, I won't go into it, but the story is about a, a boy called Jordan who moves to a new school and he starts uh, seeing a ghost. But it turns out that the ghost is, in fact, actually some sort of premonitory, like, hallucination for what he's going to do to a child. So he ends up, he ends up, he ends up murdering a kid. But then right at the end, he realises that the kid was him. Okay, right. <laughs> so this other book that I, um, that I wrote, I was like seven, I think, about six or seven years old. I even sent this to a book publisher. Yeah, wrote it, sent it to a book publisher, because at the time I thought that uh, a children's book publisher was uh, a publisher of books for children and not books written by them. So they very kindly read it and did reply with, <laughs> well, they replied with uh, just a sort of standard form, didn't even go to any trouble, and then just sort of signed it, just the, just the, the, the template. Uh, dear Jordan Brooks, thank you for sending us the enclosed manuscript. Unfortunately, it does not fit into our publishing program, and so we're returning it to you herewith. But we wish you every success in placing it elsewhere. I'm afraid that it is against company policy to comment on manuscripts other than those we are accepting for publication. At the bottom, they've obviously printed that out and gone, well, that's we can't send that to a, an actual child. <laughs> so then they've written at the bottom, just sort of handwritten, sorry to write back with disappointing news. I hope you carry on writing stories and poems. And uh, I didn't. So this is the first. This is this is this is the only. This is the only one of those. Again, self-published. Done the back. Uh, other books in this. So this is called Amazing Ghost Stories, some poems, and a funny joke. Illustration on the front is uh, sort of dude with a with a thing. There's sort of like a like a close-up version of that thing. I think that's like a monster sort of bursting through the page, and those are like uh, like maybe the sort of paw prints of a bear. Or something. So the other books in the series are Ghost Book Set. This is the whole thing. Amazing Ghost Stories, Super Duper Ghost Stories, Double Super Ghost Stories. Okay. Right, I'll read you some, read you some selections, and then I'll and then I'll and then I'll go. I think maybe that's that's enough. I don't know how funny these are. They're not really that funny. But I'll read you a few. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is the first one: The Night Fright. Once in a theatre, a man was alone checking the door if they were locked. The theatre was being closed down for two years. The man was just locking his office when he heard a noise behind him. He looked behind him, but no one was there. So he turned around and locked the door. But just then he went, heard the noise again. So he looked behind him. But just before he turned back round again, something grabbed him and chained him to the wall. And then he built another wall over him. The man behind the wall suddenly died. And then when the people came back, they saw that there was an extra wall. They knocked it down. And when they knocked it down, there was a skeleton. 
Shit your pants, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this should give you an idea also of like what where what my main source of stories, poems, and jokes were. Basically, these are just ghost stories that my dad told me. So like he worked, he he paint, he was painting a theatre once, so that's where that one came from. Next one, he was a taxi driver, so here's the next one. The taxi fright. <laughs> one one New Year's Eve, a taxi driver was driving down a road when a strange man waved to the taxi driver. The taxi driver stopped next to the strange man. The strange man got in the car. The taxi driver asked where he wanted to go. They went through the country lanes. The strange man said, stop here, please. I'll just get my money. The strange man stepped out of the car. The taxi driver looked behind him. The man had gone. The taxi driver thought that the man had run out on him. The man left his umbrella in the car. It had his address on it. So the next day, he went to where the man got out. He saw a little house in front of him. He got out of the car and knocked on the door. A lady opened the door. The taxi driver said, did a man leave his umbrella? The lady started crying. She said, he died on New Year's Eve. He said, how? She said, he got out of a man's car. And when he got out, another car came and killed him. So cautionary tale for us all. Uh, not quite as fun as the first one. Should have, should have started with that one. Okay. Right. So the... Right, I'll read you three more ghost ones, really short ghost ones. I'll do, and then I'll read the joke to you, and then maybe I'll go. Okay. Here's one. A ghost who looked in a room. Once in a pub, a lady was in her room brushing her hair, but just then a ghost walked past and looked in her room. The lady saw the ghost in her mirror. She went down the stairs and said to a man, nobody is allowed up there. The man said, I know who it was. The lady said, who is it? The man said, a man had this pub before us and he died up there. That's that one. Next one, the ghost in the school. Once in a school, everyone was working when the teacher said to a boy, go and change your reading book, please. So the boy went up all the steps. He was going up the steps. He heard a noise. He looked behind him, but no one was there. So he started walking again. But just then he heard the noise again. So he looked all around him, but no one was there. But just then a ghost grabbed him and took him away. Right. Last one of what I think is a trilogy. The ghost in the garden. Once a boy was in the garden playing with his football when a ghost flew down from the sky. The boy ran to a tree and the ghost grabbed the boy's hand and the boy's hand changed to a skeleton's hand. But the skeleton's hand turned brown and the brown hand had a ribbon across it. I think the subject of all of these is my, my parents were going through quite an acrimonious divorce. Because the last story in the in the collection, and they, it is a collection, is uh, is one where it's a miserable ghost, and I think I think the subtext is I can't remember this one. I'll read it, but I think the subtext is maybe that my mum has killed the me that w was you know in Merseyside before I moved. Uh, okay, right. The miserable ghost. Once there was a girl called Lucy. She walked home by herself. Her mum had to go to work. When Lucy got home, she ran up to her room and there was the ghost. It was the miserable ghost. The ghost had a knife. The ghost killed Lucy with the knife and put her on her bed. And when the mother came home, she saw Lucy dead. Night, night. <laughs> so I think, uh, I think, I think that's it. That's the whole, that's all I wanted to show you. I hope that, I hope that was enough time. I think, I mean, I, I think it was. Hard to tell, genuinely hard to tell. But um, well, I hope you enjoyed that. This is probably the, this is the first time I've actually spoken out loud in about three weeks, so very odd. <laughs> Particularly rude, given that I live with a, with someone. But uh, thank you so much for for your time. Cheers, Jordan Brooks, everybody! Yay! I think I'm back now. Hello, Jordan. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right, thank you. How how, how is it performing to an audience of sort of nobody? To be honest, like I don't really pay much attention to the audiences anyway. So yeah, I was basically, I was basically sort of what I was basically performing now to what I imagine on stage. So it's fine. Well, I'm, well, welcome to Inside the Comedian Studio, because Jordan, you, uh, you at the moment are living a, a, a paradox because um, your your on stage, your, your your existence as a comedian is is based on you. Um, sort of being very self-deprecating, but not in a sort of, oh, poor me sort of way. You're sort of almost, you're a self-destructive um, sort of, uh, <laughs> you are. You, 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 you're daring the audience to see you as a failure, and yet you won the Edinburgh Award last year. So at the moment, how, 
how do you sort of ch channel that uh, that sort of feeling of darkness when you've got a thing pointing at you going, but actually there's, there's proof that you are you are not that. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's why I knew the day I won that my career was over. <laughs> And I think it is just a matter of time. At the moment, I feel like I'm on borrowed time. I feel like, you know when, did you ever used to watch Scrubs, the sitcom? Yes. I felt like, at the moment, I feel like I'm in that period where Scrubs officially finished, and then they, for some reason, renewed it for an extra season set in medical school. Like, I feel like I'm in an, an, an unnecessary period in my life. Yeah, you're the, you're the X-Files. It's over. Coffee. Yeah, it's over. It's done. It's done. <laughs> so... so so you, there may as well be a coronavirus anyway, as far as you're concerned. To be honest, this is this is this has played out exactly as I thought it would. So yeah, no surprises really. And are you do are you doing anything to to fill this particular void, the one that's been created by uh, current circumstances? Are you online anywhere doing things? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no need for it. <laughs> I think um, I think I will. Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna release some shows soon. So I've got um, Body of Work from 2017 Brilliant is show. gonna be free to view on Next Up for 24 hours on the 18th of April. That's my birthday. So I've asked them if they'll make it free to view, and then I'm gonna invite people to donate to uh, an OCD charity, uh, and then also maybe to their Next Up sort of fund as well that they're they're raising money to sort of give to comedians and stuff, which I think is really good. And then I'm going to maybe put, so there's a show that I did uh, in 2018 called Bleed. That's going to go online soon, I think, which should be fun. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, but in terms of original content, no, 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 as I say, nothing, nothing. And, uh, and there's a bit of a crossover with, because I know there's, uh, there's comedy fans watching, but there's also, um, there's probably a few Doctor Who fans watching. Jordan, your granddad directed The Celestial Toymaker. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he hated it. <laughs> His his uh, his story about it is uh, it, it 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 never it never seemed to make him less angry as time went on. Like he was, <laughs> he was always very very distraught by it. Did you hear? I mean, presumably he told you the story behind the production. Yeah. The sort of turbulent production. Yeah. So it sounds like everything was sort of made very last minute, and um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everything went wrong, and then William Hartnell wasn't there for a couple of weeks, and yeah, all sorts. Yeah, and they, yeah, yeah. At the last minute, yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, he directed um, those lost, and they're still lost. I think those episodes, aren't they? The last episode out of four exists, but the others are, are, are gone. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. It's so yeah. It was, it was such a lovely thing for him to do. But how weird that I'd written to him and got a letter from him the week you played Excess Malarkey, and then somebody mentioned, "Oh, Toby does a Doc Two thing," and you went, "Oh, my granddad directs Doc Two. Did I tell you? Did I straight? Did I straight away tell you? I, I think it just sort of came because, yeah, I think it did. It certainly came up that night that you were at the gig for the first time, and you weren't yeah, yeah. or anything. You were just going, and uh, and you said, "Oh, it's, it's called Bill Sellers." So I got a letter from him two days ago, uh, <laughs> and then yeah, I went, it, was really, it was really bizarre. Um, yeah, but it's. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that he did send you that letter because I know he didn't say very nice things. <laughs> he's saying like oh you got to grow up man stop <laughs> stop loving Doctor Who so much like everyone grows out of that by 50 he was like really abusive and like not 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 nice <laughs> genuinely not nice stuff and I didn't think he had it in him and I was weirdly I was weirdly like I was horrified but I was I was also strangely impressed that a man of his age could could stoke up so much rage inside him <laughs> yeah and I've never left the house since so. <laughs> This coronavirus has been perfect. Yeah, the coronavirus of the mind. <laughs> well, Jordan, uh, they can, you're on Twitter, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, and very funny you are on it too. So what is it at Jordan Brooks? At Jordan Brooks, yeah, at yeah. At Jordan Brooks. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for, for giving us your time. Oh, um, no worries. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. What, what a treat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Jordan Brooks. Yay! Well, we have... We have one more act to come, and there was something that I was supposed to say. Oh, yes, because Jordan mentioned about uh, that you, you can donate on this thing because all comedians have had their, their uh, work uh, sort of cut. So if you would like to donate, there's, there's things that you can do here, apparently. I don't know. Um, uh, I'd be terrible on QVC. Um, now we have uh, – we're, we're about to have be bestowed – 
uh, the person responsible for my favourite excess malarkey gig of last year, who had not graced us with their presence uh, in our previous uh, 22 years. So it was a, a late blossoming of a relationship that I am delighted to reignite this evening. So uh, somebody who appeared in in the sort of, you know, somebody, somebody who's got an illustrious history uh, in broadcast media, uh, the, the, who she needs no introduction, but I have to give one anyway. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one and only, the actress Anna Mann, ladies and gentlemen. Anna Mann, Anna Mann. Hello, Anna. Hello, hello, my darlings. Hello, I'm just going to look at myself here. I just want to see, I'm sorry, bless you, darling. Hello, hello. Hello, I wish I could see you. Fuck, I wish I could see you. Fuck, I wish I could crawl through my screen and sit there with you right now and eat a biscuit together or something, anything, stroke a cat. Just chat, you know, because it's awful being locked in these holes, isn't it? But I can't be with you. I imagine you're sat there right now, greedy with anticipation. What's going to happen? What's she going to do? Have we got the right show, Margaret? I love that. Fuck, I love that. I'm yes, as as the man said, Toby. I'm Anna Mann, um, actress, singer, welder. Got to have a backup. Uh, siren of the stage and screen. I've been in everything, my darlings, and I've been cut from most things. Um, I was in the original, 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 original production, sort of the read through of uh, the Lion King. I don't know if anyone's seen that, um, where all the animals crawl over you at the start. Yes, I played the elephant's fanny. Had to be taken out. It is a children's show. You know, I've been in so many things. My dad, I was very famous film, very famous film recently. Started life as a little production called Dead Island. You might have heard of this. Then they changed it to Island of the Dead. This happens in films. If you're thinking of going into films, you must. Then they changed it to Everyone on this Island is Dead. Then they changed it to I'm Dead Are You, Let's Get Off the Island. Till finally they settled on... Um, Downton Abbey to move it. Wonderful fun. It really was. It really was. I hope <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this, darling. I have no idea. I must. Uh, you're a little quiet, love, someone said. Fuck. Can you hear me now? Is that better? I have a mic I have a proper microphone given to me by my Is that better? Fuck. Do I need to repeat the whole thing again? Oh Jesus, no. Christ. I mean, I'm screaming. Inside, I'm really screaming. This coronavirus is really messing with my anxiety, honestly. I've suffered a lot from depression and its pissy little sister anxiety. Um, I don't know if anyone else has at home. When I found out I had the problem, I went straight to the NHS. And surprise, surprise, they can't help me with that. You know, I mean, they were a dentist, but still. No, but um, bless the NHS. You're doing a wonderful job. Vive la NHS. What's French for NHS, anyone? Oh, le NHS. So, yes, here I am. In my flat, my best friend Sue Clinch has been pushed into the toilet. It's the only room she really feels at home. She's not well, bless her. She's not well. Let's just say she can get to the post box, but she can't post any letters. If you know, and she's not even allowed to do that anymore. I went out the other day on a space hopper. Um, we found it in the attic. It was my husband, John Smells, smells it. I said, Sue, am I all right to go out on this? She's very worried about perception, you know, public perception. Um, I was sat in the front garden the other day and people were giving me some real funny looks. I mean, it wasn't my front garden, so. But no, I got on the space hopper. I went bouncing out and could not find a single bit of government guidance on how long I should go out space hopping for. Running, 30 minutes. Walking, an hour. Space hopping, nothing. Anyway, I'm pretty fucked off by this whole coronavirus thing, to be honest. I mean, I, I actually went to the doctor before it all kicked off. Um, I, I, he sat me down. Apparently, I, I wasn't very well. He sat me down. He said, darling, I'm afraid the prognosis is not great. I went, right. He said, darling, you do know what a prognosis is? I said, it's, yes, it's sort of like the snout of a mosquito. He said, no, darling, that's a proboscis. I went, fuck. Thank God I thought I was turning into an insect. He said, no, we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to get some help for your darling. I said, I said, oh, God. He said, how do you feel? I said, well, pretty fucking miffed, to be honest, Doc. I didn't even have an appointment. You know, I only came in here to get away from Sue Clinch, who's on the warpath because I'd hidden her boomerang again. But no, these are very difficult times. They really are. I think a lot of depression starts in childhood. I really do. Um, I mean, I had a very difficult childhood. Mum, um, real matriarch, you know, ruled the house with an iron fist and a gammy leg. 
Um, awful woman, awful. She really was. Uh, I'm not going to bang on about her. You may have read my autobiography, Mummy Won't Buy Me a Horse. And of course, the sequel, Mummy Did Buy Me a Horse, but then she shot it. The point is, she was awful. I used to think she was bipolar, but I've decided she's just polar. She's just horrible. Um, dad, lovely chap, very small, honestly, really small, tiny, honestly, really, honestly, really, really tiny, honestly, barely visible to the naked eye. Very creative man, played the guitar like no one else, played it like flute, it sounded terrible. But no, it was very tough growing up in that environment. I grew up in Nottingham, I don't know if you know it. Um, and it was very hard to be the only wonderful thing in such a drab place. I mean, we were very poor. This was Nottingham in the 70s. We often had to choose between curtains and trousers. Father often had to go to work in his pants. It was awful. I remember once sitting on the bus, rough place it was, sitting on the bus as a seven-year-old girl. I was actually only six, but I was already very good at acting. And this chap, and not a chap, sorry, someone poked me on the back on my shoulder. I turned around and said, yes, darling. They said, you think you're dead clever, don't you, reading like that? I went, darling, I'm reading The Dandy. It's a comic. They went, ugh, educated. I said, mum, will you fuck off? You know, it really was very hard. But no, I've been in so much. It's, it's very difficult, this whole coronavirus thing, as you may have noticed, some of you. It's hard for me because all my work is gone, and I only had about £10 coming up. Um, but I was in a few films this year, all of which have now been cancelled. If I say um, low-budget horror flick, Randy Man 2, anyone? Might feel a little ripple of recognition. Say his name five times, and a quite Randy Man jumps out the mirror and chases you around. It wasn't great. Um, and of course, the low budget disaster flick, uh, low budget disaster flick, flash in the pan, all about a very small but easily contained fire. A lot of excitement, a lot of suspense, drumming, a lot of shots of this pan, and then people chatting in the kitchen, then back to the pan, and then people chatting in the kitchen, you know, and you're like, fuck, what's going to happen? But when it does, it was just a very disappointing poof, you know. I said, darlings, am I getting paid for this? They said, you're going to have whatever's left in the pan which I thought was better than The Kick in the Teeth, you know, which was the other film I did this year, A Kick in the Teeth, um, starring Danny Dyer and the foot of Sean Bean. Uh, he got 12 grand for that. I thought that's a lot of money for a foot. You know what I mean, darlings? But when you saw it in action, you were like, fuck, yeah, that's where the money's gone, very long and very northern. But also I performed a lot of, um, a lot of Shakespeare, of course. I... Some of you may love Bill Shakes. I don't know. I love you, Bill. If you're up there listening to us, thank God he's not here to witness this. Honestly, genuinely. Thank God he's not here to have to go through this. He'd write a fucking sonnet about it. That's the last thing we need. No, but Bill, 500 years he's been gone. It's horrible. Feels like yesterday, doesn't it? I did a play with my late-ish husband. He's not quite there yet. Um, this could be it. Uh, Sir Peter Runway. Um, very talented man, very talented man. Couldn't keep in his pants, if you know what I mean. He was a flasher. That's how we met. Um, and also what killed him in the end, or would have killed him, almost killed him. He's not dead, fuck. Um, but no, lovely chap. Um, no, you'll laugh, darlings, you'll laugh. But the amount of times, it's a real problem in the theatre, the amount of times I've had to cut short a much ado about nothing just to tell someone on the front row to put their willy away. Um, well, it's twice. It's two times. Both times in my eighth husband. Sadly, he was playing Mercutio. It's not even the right play. No, but what Sir Peter did do with me, he directed me in a version of The Tempest. And he's very clever, Sir Peter. What he did, which was great, was he um, modernized it. He brought it to the modern world, you know, for you people, so you can understand what's going on. So it's not just words that we don't know in an order that doesn't make sense. So he modernized, you know, iPhones instead of daggers, stuff like that, a, a sofa, just little things that made a hell of a difference. And what he did was a version of The Tempest. Um, but rather than set it on a desert island, he set it in an office in Leicester. And then rather than make it about, you know, whatever that play is about, he made it about sexual harassment of the workplace. The Tempest, you see. Actually very clever, very clever, very clever. You might not think it now, but in a bit you'll go, no, that was actually very clever. No. It um, didn't work. Not what the play's about. Made no sense. The audience left in droves. But darling, I, I guess I've got a bit more time, have I? I don't know how long I've talked. Fuck. Could have been hours. Could have been days. Time has no meaning in this flat. 
The only the only bit of time is whether Sue's woke up again. And if Sue Clinch wakes up, get out of her way, because she will come a thump it. She really will. She's awful before she's had her six coffees and seven donuts. We're running out of food. We're running out of food, darlings, you know. I've had to start killing seagulls. It's awful. But they taste delicious. Anyway, no, and I, I am a vegan in my own way. I want to stop. I mean, we're all vegans here, I presume. But I, I really do try. I really do. The spirit is there. Fuck the spirits are there. But every night I go to bed and go, right, that's it. No more meat for me, Sue. No more meat for me. I'm not eating meat anymore. I'm a vegan. And then every morning, someone's frying sausages in the kitchen. And it's always me. But anyway, what was I talking about? Fuck. Oh, yeah. So if I've got a few more minutes, um, before this all kicked off, I was about to embark on a sort of world tour of Swansea. Um, performing my play, How We Stopped the Fascists. It was an educational piece, all about this horrible rise in um, in fascism that we've seen across the world um, recently, a lot of populism, popularism, 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 um, and nationalism. And it's a real scary time we're living in. Obviously, now it's more scary but it was already quite scary. Um, and it's a real problem. It really is. You know, I worked very hard. They told me not to do the show, right? You're too old, Anna. You don't know what you're talking about. Stick to what you're good at, sleeping and crying. Somebody's going to get hurt. It'll be Aliens, the musical, all over again. You're probably feeling a bit of ripple of recognition there. No one in space can hear me scream, but boy, can they hear me sing. You remember? Yeah. He's no good for you, says mommy. Put a creature in your tummy. He's up to no good. He's got acid for blood. But I can't help it if I love him. Close the first night. No, honestly, they're handing out P45s during the interval. But no, that was before anyone died. But no, I had to do my show. I had to do it because I really felt I had to make a difference. You know, should I do it? I say to Sue Clinch, one day we're lying in bed, both of us wrapped around a sheesh, me the pipe, she the kebab. She's not well. And she turns to me, she goes, do it, Anna, do the show. She's not well. All her face is coming off. It's horrible. So I do, I've started working on the show. Now, back in the day, I worked very hard um, on helping to stop the fascists, the old fascists back in the 80s, um, and in the Tittery Wapit Chiswick. I don't know if anyone knows that venue, Tittery Wapit Chiswick, a tiny venue. You can only fit about three people in. We once managed six, but half of them had to sit on the stage. It became very hard to tell who was in it and who wasn't. So in the end, I just sat down and watched. And to be honest, it was a lot better than usual. But no, we did a play called No More War, Please. Um, I know the please is polite. That was my husband, John Smell, Smelzy. He was a very polite writer. Um, what else did we do? Down with Thatcher, please. Um, I am what I am, if that's okay with you. And of course, uh, end apartheid, if at all possible. But no more war, please. That was our opus. I perform my piece. I slop off stage, drenched in sweat, none of it my own. And there's John Smells, smells it. My lover, my muse, my muesli, my Cocoa Pops, my brand. Was I good, John? Anna, you are magnificent. And then he died instantly. Writing is dangerous. You could say it was more dangerous than cancer, and you'd be wrong. But as he fell, he said, did we do it? Did we stop the fascists? Yes, my darling, we did. And I like to think that play brought down the Thatcher government. I don't think it's hyperbolic of me to say that, mainly because I don't know what hyperbolic means. Anyway, cut to 2000 and whenever I started working on this show, 17, shall we say. What is going on? We've got Trump. We've got the alt-right. War is everywhere. Coffee is incredibly pricey. I need 17 just to get up. It's costing me hundreds of pounds. Climate change. The fascists say it's not even real. Look around you. I'm boiling. Julian Assange, I don't know what that is. It's a very difficult time. And I won't do the whole show now, obviously, because, you know, Sue's calling. Um, but basically, uh, at the end of the show, I ask a lot of questions. And one of the big questions is, how do we do it, Hannah? How do we stop the fascists, right? And the truth is, I don't know. I don't. And to be honest, I'd be surprised if you thought I did. I mean, I'm an actress with some of the thickest people on the planet. I remember David Suchet had to do next year at RADA just to learn how to open a door. You know, that's how thick we are. 
one thing I've learned as I tour this country of ours, all the people I meet, they're all proper tools, but they're all different in their own way. And they just want to matter. I think everyone wants to matter, you know? And I think if you tell enough people they don't matter, is it any surprise when they follow the first idiot who tells them that they does, do? Is it does or do? It's do. The first idiot who tells them they do. Like the time I followed my 12th husband, Jim Peach, onto a production of uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. It was a northern version called uh, Set in a mine, obviously. And, and he made me wear, I was playing um, Titania, and he made me wear a headdress that was, well, essentially a live owl. It ripped the skin off my head. I almost lost an eye, you see. But I did it because he told me I mattered. But I don't matter. None of us matter. Bless you, darlings, all at home. You don't. You don't. You're in your pod, and you honestly, you really don't matter. So we have to make each other matter. Renounce our hatred. It's the only weapon the fascists have. What's the opposite of hate? Yoga. Everyone do yoga, all right? And just calm down. Well, I think that's enough from me, is it, my darlings? What do we think? I feel like it's gone on an age. But what an age. What a good age. Toby, hello. Thank you. The sound of one man clapping. I mean, I can't actually even hear you. I just want to hear oh. you clapping, Toby. Oh, you almost... No, no, it's gone again, darling. There we go. One more time. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. One more clap. Fuck, that's why we do it. That's why we do it. <laughs> I'd only be I... one strange man <laughs> in a strange room clapping, but that's why we do it. That's why we get into this business and why we can't leave. We're addicted, right, Toby? Absolutely. And and you can still you can still do it from the comfort of your flat, I hope. Um, yes, yes, I'm on the chaise long. And um, and it struck me because you mentioned some of your husbands there, and how how many husbands mm. have you had in all? Oh, fuck, I don't know. Um, it's it's definitely between 12 and 17, but there's a good three or four in the middle. I can barely remember, honestly, because a lot of it, especially in the Tittery Whoppet back in the day, it was just drugs, wall to wall, all the very rough plays back in the day. Um, and there was, I mean, there was the first one, of course, there was Tony Sandwich. Yeah. Tony Sandwiches. He, he ran Tony Sandwich, Tony Sandwich. Then John Smells, Smellsy. Then lovely Jim Peach, bless him, who we actually lost in the marketplace of Marrakesh and was never seen again. So. Um, then a few others that are sort of hazy. Harold Bagg, it's my daughter Mahogany's father, Harold Bagg. Unfortunately, she took both our names, so she's known as Mahogany Man Bagg. Um, and um, Rupert Murdoch. And uh, right up to more recently, of course, Tim Smiles, lovely chap. Less than, but all gone, all gone. Denny go lightly, of course. There were so many, so many, darling. And um, and uh, during this, I probably uh, married you. <laughs> you may well have done. I think there are a few nights where uh, neither of us woke up knowing where we were. Well, yes, yes. Um, and um, uh, what uh, uh, have you been doing? Anything? Uh, have you got any plans for doing more stuff online where people can? Uh, Yes, yes, yeah. I can plug that, can't I? Yes, please do. I'm doing um, my own, well, normally I used to do a cheese and sex party back in the day, you know, we'll chat about this and that, you know, blowjobs, camembert. Um, so now we're doing a cheese, sex and self-isolation party every Saturday on Twitch again at Next Up Comedy. Excellent, every it's Saturday. It's been a lot of fun, every Saturday at 10. It's been a lot of this sort of stuff, you know. Well, I'm, I'm, but I am surprised because when I saw the, um, the, you know, the Grace and the Good doing that version of Imagine, which I'm sure you'll agree was yes. the acting profession. Fuck, that was good, world, wasn't it? I, I'm surprised that an activist like yourself hadn't organised something, something, you know, maybe you and Robin Asquith and Anita Harris doing oh, yesterday. Fuck, that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Get the old gang together. Maybe get Sue Clinch to do the middle bit. Yeah. Fuck, what could we sing? Well, uh, Pass the duchy to the left-hand side? Something like that. I, I, would, I think I think that's what the world is waiting for. I did the um, um, musical youth, um, or, the original musical youth musical. <laughs> okay. We still passed that duchy. It was great. Great. How many nights did that run for? 
Three. Three. <laughs> That's Three. Not the last one had to be stopped halfway through by the police. But, you know, for two nights, we almost got to the end. <laughs> And 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 are you are you cope are you well in yourself because we I know that you, because you're a consummate pro you know you always put on a brave face but but how are you doing yourself Anna? I feel like if I see any of these walls again, I'm going to smash them. That's all I can say, or daub them, if you know what I mean, with I something, my own body. I don't know. I feel like I've gone through every jigsaw in the house. That's two jigsaws. Um, I almost read a book the other day. It's really getting bad. It's really bad. I've read all of Twitter. It's just, you know, Sue got her Play-Doh out, so that kept us going for a little bit. And apparently you can make more, but we've run out of tartar sauce, which is an ingredient. So that's fucked. I've washed everything except myself. And um, I've, ba- I've started counting all my money. So that's 12 pounds. It's just awful. How are you feeling, Toby? Well, I'm all right. I feel much better to have connected with an illustrious member of the profession like yourself, Anna. You were always a ray of sunshine. Yes, yes. I feel like I brought the tone down at the end there. What I like to do is open the window because there's a lot of joggers go past and scream at them. What are you doing, you maniacs? Get inside. Pretend I'm Piers Morgan. Yes, that's yes. Well, if, 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 yes, if we can do nothing else, it's shout at our fellow citizens. I think. We can judge each other. Right. Yeah. We really have got the right this time. I mean, we always judge each other, let's be honest, but now it's life and death. Well, we can do it out loud. Well, I can really go for it. No. And, and you, you can obviously project, so uh, that's I even better. Project. I once projected to, um, to Kinshasa. <laughs> so it's almost your civic duty as a member of the acting profession to put your powerful larynx to judgmental use. I did, yes, I did put in to the government to... to give me that role, you know, kind of like as we have in, in a lot of those wonderful countries in the Middle East, you know, the man on the tower, the, the, the min, min, what it's called, darling? Do you remember? He does the call to prayer. I thought oh, I yeah. could do that, but, you know, just tell, just go, get in! Yes. Get inside, you know? Yeah, the call to quarantine. Call to quarantine, yes. Why not? Well, uh, uh, the end of the show is calling, Anna, so uh, thank you so much, because you've only played Excess Malarkey, uh, the I once. Know. We were, I we, know. Were we were up for more, weren't we? And then this happened. And then this happened. But uh, our mm. doors will open and you will be more they than welcome. Now, oh, fuck, Jordan Brooks is back. Jordan Brooks is fuck, back. He's got a face on him. <laughs> oh, he's got a face on him. <laughs> oh, and Matt Kirsch. Oh, Matt, everyone's back. Hello. Hello. We're all back. Hello, Matt. A closing title sequence. <laughs> um, <laughs> any last messages <laughs> for the viewers, guys? And, and, and thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Well, I speak for everyone. Yeah, so I, I, I also uh, would like Anna to speak for me. All right. That, well, thanks for joining us, Matt. No, Matt says thanks for joining us. <laughs> no, Matt says thanks for having us. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, um, for those we, the, those we can't see, I don't know what you can see, but Robin Ince and Olga Koch, and you can see um, just <laughs> what's what's uh, something. Oh, is that about, what you were doing? Yes, yes, he's... He's, he's uh, brandishing his accolades, uh, uh, which we, we've all done in the privacy of our own homes before now. Um, we've all brandished our accolades on the internet. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Over uh, video. By now, we just can't see. Uh, and uh, so, Matt Kirshen, Jordan Brooks, Anna Mann, and from me, Toby Haydock, this has been Excess Monarchy. We hope you like watching us here every Tuesday. We'll be back next week with people, and I'm not so sure if I'm allowed to plug them or not, so I won't, but it will be a fantastic mm-hmm. lineup. Keep an eye on the Twitter feed. Um, please do the PayPal thing uh, and uh, stay safe. Lots of love. And thank you very much. And good night. Stay safe. Bye.